Welcome everyone. Welcome to the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies. My name is Norani Lijan and I'm Director of the Information Law and Policy Centre, one of the academic centres based at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies within the University of London. And we're delighted you are able to join us here today for the Centre's annual lecture and conference, Data in a Pandemic, Rights and Responsibilities. We have a really excellent programme of panels and events taking place over the next two days with regulators, practitioners, representatives from industry, civil society, and academic experts who will explore the impact of the global pandemic on society and the increased use of data-driven systems, particularly the implications of these changes for the rights and responsibilities of individuals and governments and the private sector. We're very excited about the fact that this is going to be a very rich conversation that is multidisciplinary and cross-sector with perspectives and insights brought by a fantastic lineup of speakers who are going to be joining us from all over the UK, Europe, North America, and Asia. Over the next two days, we'll be exploring the major policymaking challenges for governments raised by the catastrophic impact of the pandemic and the key questions for society that are ongoing as we head towards the fourth wave of the pandemic. These questions include how do we ensure the protection of the rule of law and fundamental rights to privacy, freedom of expression and equality, to name just a few, in what has become effectively an ongoing state of emergency during an international health crisis? What trustworthy responses and communication strategies can governments and other organisations implement to address their responsibilities to manage pandemic fatigue that the public faces from long lasting restrictions? What policies should be implemented in order to effectively tackle the challenges of online disinformation that have focused on vaccination side effects and even pandemic denial? Finally, what important lessons can be drawn from data gathered from evaluating the effectiveness of the pandemic responses to date in order so that we can rebuild public trust in the use of data-driven measures and systems and in health monitoring technologies and also for the use of data in health and medical research and to better inform future policymaking that respects the rule of law, rebuild society as a whole and also protects human rights in a democratic society. And on that note, it is a true honor and a very great pleasure to introduce our speaker this morning, Professor Diane Coyle. Diane Coyle is the Bennett Professor of Public Policy at the University of Cambridge, where she co-directs the Bennett Institute and heads research programs under the themes of progress and productivity. Her own research focuses on the digital economy and digital policy, and on concepts and measurement of economic welfare. Diane is also a director and research theme leader of the Productivity Institute, a fellow of the Office for National Statistics, an advisor to the Competition and Markets Authority, and senior independent member of the ESRC Council. She has served in a number of public service roles in the past, including as vice chair of the BBC Trust, member of the Competition Commission and the Natural Capital Committee. Her career began in the Treasury in the mid 1980s after gaining her undergraduate degree at Brainerd College, Oxford and a PhD in economics from Harvard University. Subsequently, she worked as a private sector economic forecaster and then spent 12 years in journalism, including as economic editor of The Independent until 2001. Diane, then, Diane pardon me, then founded the consultancy Enlightenment Economics and was a professor of economics at the University of Manchester until 2018. Her first book, The Weightless World, about the digital economy and society was published in 1997. Key subsequent books include The Soulful Science, the Economics of Enough, GDP, A Brief but Affectionate History, and Market, State and People. A constant theme in Diane's work has been the way technological change is driving profound shifts in the structure of the economy, and consequently how economic analysis and policy advice 
need to adapt if they are to help understand and deliver broad-based economic progress. Her new book, published just last month, Cogs and Monsters, is motivated by these key underlying questions. Diane is also an ardent advocate of better communication by economists and the need for a conversation between the profession and the public. She founded and still co-directs the annual Bristol Festival of Economics, now in its 10th year. Diane is also a board member of the Economics Observatory, founded in 2020 by a group of economists as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and has contributed to RES campaigns to diversify the economics profession. She has been a trustee at different times of the Center for Economic Policy Research, Pro Bono Economics, Core Education, and the National Institute of Economic and Social Research, where she was chair between 2014 and 2020. She was awarded a CBE for her contribution to the public understanding of economics and holds honorary degrees from Portsmouth and Bristol universities. Diane, you're very welcome. In terms of format for this morning, Diane will speak for between 20 to 30 minutes, and she will then join our keynote panel that takes place afterwards here after we have a short coffee break at 11.15. If we do have some time before that break and there are any comments or questions from the floor, we may be able to address them quickly before the 11 o'clock break. But if not, do not worry, we'll be addressing them afterwards in the keynote panel. So I would like to thank all of our speakers, discussants, chairs, and all those attending for being here and joining us today. And I'll now invite Professor Diane Coyle to deliver the ILPC's annual lecture for 2021 entitled An Economist's Perspective on Data and Its Value. Diane, whenever you're ready. Thank you very much for that uh, very generous introduction. It just always makes me feel quite old when I hear the list of things that I've, that I've done over the years. Um, it's also an honour to be, I gather, the first economist giving this keynote, so thank you for that as well. Um, I'm hoping my screen is showing. Um, it's a bit odd as an economist to see all the hype that exists about data now, because we have been using data for a long time. Most economists do empirical work. They use at least moderately big data sets and have um, the, the statistical methods for understanding what's going on in society have data at their heart. So for many years now, my research has been about um, how, does, how is data constructed? What does it mean? How does the data that we see um, shape policy and shape people's behaviors? Nevertheless, it's clear that data is at the heart of the modern economy now. And all of these upstart machine learning and AI types are now uh, emphasizing the role of big data and its potential to contribute to society. But I think it's fair to say that thinking among economists about data as an economic asset or a factor of production in the economy is still in its early days. So I want to start by talking a bit about how economists think about data, what, what's the analytical framework we have for thinking about it, and some of the implications of that. And then uh, later on, talk about some of the work that I'm doing, trying to understand the value of the data that the digital revolution is now putting at the center of economic activity, H having profoundly reshaped our daily lives, the way we spend our time, business models, the kinds of products and services we can access. The latest figures from Ofcom are that we're spending a day, more than a day a week um, online, and uh, all of that is generating and involving the use of data. So um, there are two lenses, really, that you can bring to bear on how to think about the potential value of data to society. And when I say value, I mean it in this economic sense of um, what we would call economic welfare in the jargon. So not just monetary value and not just the value that private market participants can gain, but the potential um, economic benefit to society as a whole from the way that the resources available to us are, are used and shared. And what this slide shows is that there are two lenses um, that structure the way I think about it. And the first column here is the economic theory lens. Data is not like many other economic goods in that its key feature is non-rivalry. And what that means is that 
Um, it's not used up once one person uses it. It can be used by many different people at the same time or successively, it's not depleted. And so this makes it, in the jargon, a public good like air or access to a park that isn't walled. But it can be excluded to bring you another piece of economic jargon. And so through either legal or technical means, people can be prevented from using the data, even if its fundamental economic characteristic is non-rivalry. There are also many externalities involved, uh, both positive and negative. And the one that's most prominent in public debate is the negative externality of loss of privacy. Data that I post or data that I use can involve a loss of privacy for other people. But there are also positive externalities, combining different kinds of data or just making some uh, personal data available can bring benefits to other people. And I'm going to talk much more about these key characteristics of non-rivalry and externalities. There are also other features that will play into the economic policy debate. One is about the nature of the returns to investment in data. And that depends on the use to which it's being put. If you're collecting data about individual spending patterns to do marketing analytics, that kind of data has decreasing returns because um, once you learn enough about what certain kinds of people and how, do and how they spend their money, the extra information you get from adding more and more individuals data to that stockpile is uh, decreasing. But there are some kinds of data where there are rapidly increasing returns. And um, an example might be sensor data for autonomous vehicles, where the more granularity you have there, the more efficiently and safely those vehicles will be able to operate. Similarly, the depreciation characteristics of the data assets are very different depending on the type of data. And some will have a very long uh, lifespan, um, others will depreciate very quickly. So those sen road sensor data um, will um, depreciate very quickly because traffic conditions will change all the time, but some other types will um, have a very long lasting um, value. Uh, like many digital goods, data have very high initial fixed costs and then very low marginal costs. This characteristic is true of lots of industries in the economy, aerospace and autos would be other examples, but this structure is extreme in um, the digital um, arena. And this is why we have so many digital services that have a zero price to consumers, but those costs get covered in other ways. And finally, data needs lots of complementary investments to make it useful from the uh, gigantic concrete and um, uh, cable infrastructure of data centers to the kind of skills that you need to be able to use the data effectively. So those features structure um, the economic theory about data and its potential value. There's also um, a lot of contextual information that changes that value as well. And this all points to the fact that the value of data depends very substantially on the use to which it's put and those uses can be very varied. And so here's a list of some of those. Um, data sensitivity, is it personal data? Is it a particularly sensitive type of personal data such as finance or health? Or is it internet of things data within a factory? Um, what, uh, what's the provenance? What's the quality? Can you trust uh, the, what the, the classifications and the data is telling you what it reports to? How accurate is it as a reflection of what it says it's measuring? How general is it? Is it reference data such as much ge geospatial data? Or is it uh, much more specific in its potential uses? And um, what are its, um, what is its interoperability um, how are the data records structured? How accessible is it to be used? And so all of this right-hand column here affect the highly varied use values of data. So this is the basic framework in which um, I'm thinking about the value of data. And there are some immediate conclusions that you can draw from that. It's economics 101, it's, it's first year economics that these public good contexts mean that market solutions are not going to be the efficient solutions. And so it immediately points to the need for some kind of collective um, uh, framework, legal framework or policy framework for getting the best uses out of all the data that's now being generated. And the social and the private value will diverge. Um, 
the negative externality that we all immediately think about is the potential loss of privacy. But there are also many potential positive externalities also, because the value comes from the information content and the information content depends on both um, uh, context and these externalities. For example, there's much non-personal data that we might want to be kept private. One example would be having a smart meter and not wanting people to be able to access that data, even though it's nothing to do with me as a person, because it might tell somebody when the house is empty. Um, but much personal data is only useful if it's combined with something else. One example would be taking my temperature today. It only gives me information if I know what it should be and therefore what the population average is. And there's positive or potential positive information for other people. If I were not online, but in a crowded conference hall, there'd be positive information for other people in knowing that my temperature was normal or not. And what this says to me is that privacy is actually not a single or simple concept and it needs unpacking more carefully. And so the right to privacy that is um, spoken of in legal contexts is a complicated concept when you take into account these, um, these potential externalities. I've already said that the use values are highly varied, which creates some challenges when you're trying to think about the empirics of data value, which I'll come on to. And this relational character means that, and, and the non-rivalry means that it's not like classic economic goods where you can clearly assign property rights in a way that means that market transactions are the economically efficient transactions. And also that the privacy that we're talking about isn't about me as an individual, it needs interpreting in a social context, it's a social. <laughs> and so the question is what does this mean for the policy choices that we're going to be making? I just want to say a little bit more about some of these um, points. And the first is about the positive externalities. There are many possibilities for combining different kinds of data. This illustration is from the Strava heat maps. Strava is a fitness app and people wear it on their watches and it tracks their runs. Strava then combines the data and puts maps on its website to show um, which are the best running routes or the popular running routes at any rate. And they did this for this particular set of runs, which turned out to be a secret US airbase. I think it's in Afghanistan. And the troops had the Strava app and they um, outlined very nicely and put into the public domain the map of the um, uh, the, the whole airbase. So I think you'd call this a negative externality, but the point I'm trying to make is about sharing. And there are many examples of useful, valuable services that have been created through the possibility of combining different kinds of data. One example would be apps like CityMapper, which can combine transport data from lots of different sources, traffic data, um, mapping data, and um, combine that into a really useful app that allows us not to get stranded and to save time. And um, this would not have been possible without interventions to make some of that data openly available to providers like, like CityMapper. You could think of potential health apps that would be similar. Think about the potential to combine somebody's um, blood pressure and uh, temperature data with their shopping data, with a record they keep themselves of how much how far they're walking every day, and the useful information that could give people about behavioral changes to improve their health. There's also a competition aspect to this. I was on the Furman panel, and we focused very much on the way that big tech companies have accumulated a lot of data about individuals that is not available to others. And what's the potential for market entry in making some of that data available through open APIs? So data sharing, creates lots of um, positive potential externalities. Um, there are also these features about data being non-rival and relational. And many of you will have seen this lovely story about the eight selfies. A photographer set up a camera with a trip uh, trigger and this lovely uh, creature took its own photograph by uh, tripping the camera. And it's a lovely image. So lots of media outlets used it. It got widely shared. And the photographer went to court to claim 
um, that he had the IP rights and ought to have been paid for uses of this photograph. An animal rights charity went to court to claim that the uh, revenues actually belong to the apes and ought to go back to them in some way. This is an impossible question to answer. If I take a photograph of somebody, is it my photograph or is it theirs? And um, we've got um, conventions around that and legal structures around that. But actually, the social reality is that this is, is relational. And there are lots of issues that are being raised in um, terms of economic value and how that gets shared between companies and their users or consumers that arise from this question about ownership of rights that doesn't take account of these fundamental economic characteristics. So one example of this, for example, is John Deere tractors. And they uh, have gone to the copyright courts in the States to try to prevent farmers from mending their own tractors, as they have done since tractors were invented. And the argument, and General Motors has, has brought similar cases, the argument is that the software and the real-time information flow going through the cab of a modern tractor is such that this is really um, still owned by John Deere. They own the software rights, they own the data rights, even though, of course, that data is collected from farmers feeding it up from their land as they operate these tractors. It's combined by John Deere, it provides useful information, and that processed information is sent back to the farmers to enable them to understand better moisture conditions in the soil, the immediate weather conditions, and, and so on. And so really what John Deere is arguing is that this is a wholly owned um, intangible asset which farmers are in effect renting from then and it just happens to come with a tractor attached. Now, I think these cases are still going, going through the courts in the States, um, but this idea that the intangibles are the product and they have some add-on such as an e-reader or a car, uh, Tesla would be another example, um, uh, has become quite common. And so there is a real, not just legal and privacy debate, but a real economic debate about who gets the value from all of this data that's being accumulated. Because as I was just arguing, the value is created by combining, not by the individual data. If you go onto one of the online calculators to calculate the value of your personal data uh, in a way that some economists argue um, should be possible, and you know, that you should, if you upload data to social media, get paid for it, it works out at a very low figure. I think I did mine and it was something like $6 a year. Um, so that's very low. The value is in the combination. How does the value that's created by that combination get shared? And at the moment, it's held by the corporations who can validly argue that they have heavily invested in creating the software, in processing the data, and in doing the analytics that make it useful. But I think it's not socially viable in the long term to argue that all of that value stays with the companies. Their response would be that they are providing valuable services. Uh, but I think the um, emerging consensus is that that isn't sufficient. And if you think about a company such as 23andMe accumulating a mass of um, personal genetic data, or even the debate about GP data in the United Kingdom and access to that being sold to pharmaceutical companies, I think what we now want to understand is how is that downstream economic value actually created through use of data going to be shared among people, among individuals? How should we think about the um, economic uh, framework and the legal rules that we put around that? That's the debate that's really in its early days, I think, and is particularly acute in arenas like health data. There's also a question about what data, what data should people be allowed to combine? Um, last year, in a brief pause in um, the travel restrictions, I went to Berlin and visited the Stasi Museum, which is a fascinating lens on life in the former East Germany. And to my surprise, it turned out that East Germany had quite a strong data protection uh, legal framework. But in practice, of course, the Stasi had access to a vast amount of information about individuals. The technologies were different. They had created their own special um, uh, card filing systems. Uh, the images here are a camera that um, was um, looking onto a particular post box 
and the letters were collected. They were steamed open at Stasi HQ. And if anything was found in one of those letters, it could be tracked back to the post box and they could look back at the photographs and see who had posted letters on that particular date. And the term used was glazerna mensch, transparent people, the Stasi knew everything about people. And I think one of the privacy concerns isn't so much about personal data being reused in ways that bring positive economic benefits or social benefits. It's about the power that's created by certain entities being able to join up everything about an individual so that the people become transparent to these organizations. And uh, we worry about states having access to that uh, kind of visibility over our entire lives and also about big tech companies similarly. And this takes me to thinking about rights of access for specified purposes. In sociology, there's a concept of privacy in public. In offline life, we um, don't need to know everything about everybody we encounter. We need to know specific things about them. And they might be quite sensitive things. I might know some information about students of mine that is quite sensitive, but I really don't know, need to know very much about them. It's a narrow slice of their lives. I might be perfectly happy for my GP to have some very sensitive information about me, but I don't want the government to know about that in any joined up way. We don't have, um, in terms of social conventions and legal rules, that uh, embedded concept of privacy in public in the online world. The technologies to make that possible are um, uh, emerging very quickly. So it isn't a technological issue. It's an issue about uh, what rights do people have to access what information and what rights do they have to join up certain information. And there are some really quite challenging uh, detail and policy trade-offs to think about there. In the work that we've been doing, uh, we've been trying to think about some of these trade-offs. And one paper looks at the example of transport policy. In the um, early and mid 2010s, there was a push for open data for the public good in transport. And so, for example, private bus companies wanted to keep their timetable information private because they said it was commercially sensitive. And they argued that because what they try to do on routes where they're competing with each other is to get in just before the next bus, the competing bus comes along. But they were forced to make that openly available through this website, Transport Direct. And um, they argued that they suffered a revenue loss and perhaps they did, um, but it created the possibility for um, all these useful transport apps that subsequently got created. So there is a trade-off there. There is a loss of revenue and similarly by public providers of data, if they make the data open, but there's great public benefit and future private benefit for, for, for new service providers and for users of the services. This has uh, changed subsequently as technology has brought us digital platforms like Uber and other private apps and potentially in future autonomous vehicles. All of these apps and vehicles will be collecting data and using that um, to um, improve their own service, to compete against commercial rivals, and so that also clearly has commercial value to them. But at the same time, there is that potential public value from the data or part of it being made available to um, uh, public sector, to public sector bodies, or openly available. And that, that varies depending on the context. With autonomous vehicles, I'm um, confident that they will be forced to share quite a lot of their data for safety reasons understandably. The debate about um, private platforms like Uber, that might be somewhat different. But equally, I think there's a good public, a good case to argue that they should be required to share some of that data, both for traffic management and congestion by the public authorities, and also for competition reasons to enable future entry. But there are real questions about how to evaluate these trade-offs and we need some empirics to do this. And the empirics are actually quite hard. And this is the area that um, my team is working on at the moment. For example, public sector users need to know how much should they invest in collecting and creating data sets themselves. We actually have a fantastic set of public data through the Office for National Statistics, 
and the ESRC's um, um, administrative data uh, facility. And uh, we've seen through the coronavirus pandemic, the huge public value of combining epidemiological and economic data. And there's been an immense effort across the public sector and research bodies to put that together during the pandemic. But there is a, an obvious cost benefit question about how much of that should be done and how should it be funded? How should public bodies such as Ordnance Survey be required to charge for data that they provide? How should they price it if they are going to sell some of it commercially or sell it? And there are different ways of thinking about this. This is an example of one way, which is to use certain market prices as um, a benchmark for thinking about data value. This is a paper I co-authored with Wendy Lee looking at the stock market value of Marriott when Airbnb entered the market. So we compared what happened to Marriott's actual value, which is the blue line on the left, compared to the previous recent trend in its stock market value, and took that as an indication of the value to data using companies of using data more effectively than the incumbents, and then grossed that up for the global hospitality industry and got a figure of $45 billion in 2018 and growing reasonably rapidly. And so you could do that exercise for other sectors in the economy. This doesn't capture um, social public good value. This is about the value that investors ultimately can expect to get from companies listed on the stock market. So it's a market-based approach. To think about public good values, we're trying some stated values some stated preference um, models. And this is a discrete choice experiment, one of the standard methods for stated preference work, where you can um, uh, describe the characteristics of a data set and include price as one of those characteristics and survey users who've got some familiarity with it to understand what kinds of characteristics they value. And for a particular data set, it was World Bank economic data. Um, this experiment on 400 economists told us that they uh, particularly valued having different geographic aggregations of data and they were particularly averse to having non-open um, software standards to uh, organize the data. They wanted um, interoperable standards. And um, so we're trying both of these, we're trying other kinds of work to think about data value and address those policy trade-offs. So there are many possible methods at the moment. You can think about the costs of creating the data and maintaining it. You can think about setting up data exchanges. So you create market prices. You can use stock market values as we did. There's a machine learning technique to take um, the outcomes that firms care about, such as their profits or their productivity, and allocate part of that to the use of data as opposed to other inputs that they use. You can do the kind of experiment I just described. And we're also trying um, a real options approach, which is to think about what are the potential future uses which might make the data that we accumulate now more valuable. So that's where we've got to. Um, there's a lot of open questions and there isn't a consensus among economists about this. So I think the first slide I showed you about the analytical framework, um, there is a consensus about, about that, but on all of these other questions that I've raised today, I would say not. And so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now and maybe we've got a few minutes before the coffee break. Thank you very much, Diane. That was a very, impressively succinct, but also very rich overview of, I think, well, from a, a lawyer's perspective and not somebody with economic expertise, an incredibly important outline of all the key challenges in this area. And I think, I mean, I have a few questions as we have a few moments before the break, Diane, if you're happy to maybe discuss a few aspects that um, spoke to me in particular, from, from your lecture. And there was a few, you know, really, really interesting points. Um, you raised the example of City Mapper, for instance, and it's often provided as an example in a lot of literature about the importance of having all this transport data and the kinds of very valuable information that everyone, commuters, can rely on in terms of navigating the transport systems of London. 
I'm wondering against the backdrop of everything that you discussed this morning in terms of who gets access to that data and who has the infrastructure and the capacity and the data analytics to, to harness its value, if you think that there is a space for a, a government department providing a nap that would be of that kind of effectiveness and efficiency. City Mapper is a it's a commercial app and as you highlighted, there is there's so much incredibly valuable public data. But a major challenge, of course, is that even though the, the data has that element, <clears throat> excuse me, of data being like air, it's not held absolutely in one place by one entity or one person. That element of, you know, its its nature has made it difficult to quantify on, on many levels. And as you rightly pointed out, it doesn't just have that very important financial valuation. It also has social value. So I think my first question is about City Mapper and whether any such app would ever come from a government institute and what perhaps would be the obstacles in, in place at the moment against that. And then another question I have in terms of, of trying to be constructive in terms of the challenges that we face is one of, you know, where should a government pitch this negotiation between itself and the private sector? We already know in terms of the amount of public data that a government like the UK, but also other governments as well, have access to in terms of transport data, in terms particularly of health data. You mentioned the example earlier on about the sharing of GP data or the possibility about that that was raised by the former Secretary for Health earlier this year, that there's a huge trove of data there. But there does seem to be lots of opportunities that could be exploited by governments in terms of getting value from exchanging all that kind of medical data. So for instance, there've been a lot of instances of very large scale procurement and contracts between governments and the private sector for testing and other services that have been provided. So for one instance, you know, we have testing and one particular company, Randox, where we had, you know, in total a 600 million pounds contract. You know, do you think that there is a possibility that at the procurement stages of those kinds of legal arrangements that a question of that of data of data analytics could be provided from companies in exchange for the fact that they get to provide this service, they get to provide this service, there is a cost involved for them, there's clear benefit, but there's an awful lot of data that be, that can be collected in the delivery of that service. And what kind of level of access should governments then demand to it to say, well, this would be of huge benefit to health research, to the NHS, to the academic sector, looking into these kinds of questions about delivery of health services and the collection of such data. In your opinion, I'd be very interested to know whether the procurement stage is, is one of those particular intersections between government and the private sector where you could have those kinds of conversations. And then uh, one final question is in terms of data sharing and open access. So one of the potential solutions that's been put forward is this notion of data trusts and that individuals perhaps could be involved in a more involved relationships with private organizations in terms of valuing their data and exchanging it. But my concern in terms of a, an, an arrangement such as that is that you're placing increasing burdens on an individual to value data that they themselves won't have much information about in terms of they won't know what the data in aggregate in combination is worth but they may get indications as to like, oh, well, this particular piece of information from this particular platform, it's only valued at about $6, $12. You mentioned an earlier example before per year. So that's the kind of financial exchange we'll give you. But of course, if this particular platform is combining all these various data sets from various apps concerning your health, concerning your location, where you've been that day, you gave the the really good example of, you know, your temperature being taken, if someone does that on an app, if they're monitoring their health on a particular mobile phone, and if that same company is collecting analytics as to their location data, and later that day, they go to a COVID testing center, 
I mean, this all builds up very quickly into a very rich profile that has a lot more value than just these isolated pockets of data. Hello and welcome back, everyone. We return after the tea and coffee break from an excellent and thought-provoking annual lecture delivered this morning on an economist's perspective on data and its value, especially its social value, by Professor Diane Coyle. And if you are just joining us, please note that this morning's lecture will be made publicly available after the conference, so you can watch it at a future date, and I highly recommend that you do so. Before we begin this morning, we have just one change to announce from the current programme, which is that Olivier Theroux from the Open Data Institute is unable to join us today, and he sends his apologies. But now I am delighted to introduce you to our keynote panel this morning, and I will first introduce our first keynote speaker, Caroline Waters. Caroline is Deputy Chair of the Equality and Human Rights Commission and Vice President of Carers UK and a trustee of the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. Caroline was also Director of People and Policy at British Telecom and has a leading and distinguished record on quality, inclusion and human resources. Caroline's work at BT was recognised by several diversity awards, including Best Ethnic Minority Recruitment Programme, in 2010, she was awarded the OBE for Services to Progressive HR Practice, for Progressive HR Practice, rather, Diversity and Equal Opportunities. Caroline continues to work to build more inclusive approaches to work and is a member of the Leaders as Change Agents Board. She was listed in the Top 100 Disability Power List 2019 and voted one of the most influential human resources practitioners of the last decade by HR Movers and Shapers 2019. Caroline routinely works with and advises policymakers and has contributed to major projects, including the Department of Work and Pensions publication of the Disability and Health Employment Strategy and the Task and Finish Group on Young Disabled People and Employment. And this morning, Caroline will be discussing the impact of COVID on equality and human rights. Caroline, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Nora. Um, yes, I, that does make me feel rather old as well. <laughs> I hear all that, that list. Oh, dear. Anyway, good morning, everybody. I'd like to share some reflections on how data helped the EHRC play an important role in informing and guiding decision makers of all sorts during the COVID pandemic. And as Diana pointed out, why comprehensive data is critical and why we must make it a priority to plug data gaps and build a robust evidence base that ensures government policies work for everyone and respect our rights and promoting equality. During the COVID pandemic, we all accepted unprecedented restrictions of our rights in order to stop the spread of the virus, to protect lives and reduce pressure on the health service. As the role of data, data collection, data-driven me measures became increasingly prevalent in the task of combating that virus, at the EHRC, we worked to ensure that human rights and equality law provided a framework to help governments make critical decisions on the balance between public safety and economic interests and our shared values of freedom, respect and fairness. There is no doubt about the vital role data collection has played in helping the health service to understand the nature of the COVID virus in real detail, detecting further outbreaks and finding solutions for its prevention. It has been a key component in the plan to mitigate the pandemic and is now playing a leading role in getting us to a place where blanket lockdowns might be avoidable in the future. It has also led to the introduction of COVID status certificates, which have been enforced in Wales and Scotland and are proposed in the UK government's Plan B scenario for this winter. These passes or certificates can, of course, offer reassurance, especially to vulnerable people, that transmission of the virus can be limited in public spaces and is critical to our, enjoy of, um, our enjoyment of a sense of freedom and of, of ability to access day-to-day -day life in a natural way. However, 
We have made it very clear to government that while these passes or certificates can provide a way of lifting restrictions and safely keeping the economy open, it is important to strike the right balance between individual liberty and the rights of the others. And again, this is something Diane spoke much more eloquently about than than I can, but just that balance of individual rights and what we need to do to protect ourselves. Um, In our view at the EHRC, to ensure that this policy remains a proportionate way to keep spaces COVID secure, it requires parliamentary oversight and, very importantly, a time limit underpinned by real evidence about necessity. We also recommend that those who cannot be vaccinated for health reasons have access to exemption documentation and that detailed guidance for employers and businesses is provided to minimise the risk of any discrimination. The importance of having detailed data on who is less likely to be vaccinated was highlighted only yesterday when the Times reported that unvaccinated people are routinely turned down for jobs as more and more employers insist that candidates are double jabbed. A review of the Scottish labour market has uncovered at least seven adverts that say unvaccinated people need not apply. We've warned employers that overlooking people who refuse jabs may be illegal. The article cites our guidance for employers, in particular our guidance for pregnant women, who are less likely to have been vaccinated and could therefore be at greater risk when returning to the workplace. This is just one example of how important it is to have robust and comprehensive data to inform our approach and defend the rights of those who are already at greatest risk of disadvantage in our society. Let's look at uh, other ways. So COVID-19 has also caused governments to introduce greater automated forms of decision making. For example, the qualification regulator's decision to cancel a range of exams and assessments and instead use algorithms to provide predicted grading raised a number of key concerns. The data on existing on sorry, the data on existing inequalities led us to warn the regulator that the use of predicted grades via an algorithm could have a lasting effect on young people from certain ethnic minority backgrounds, disabled pupils, and those with special educational needs. Early research suggested the possibility that known patterns of conscious or unconscious bias, for example, in relation to race, could be problematic when predicting grades in this way. While students eventually receive teacher-assessed grades, this algorithmic policy provided a stark reminder that it is critically important that public authorities meet the requirements of the public sector equality duty. The requirement is that it must be conducted to the fullest ability and consider the needs and disadvantages facing people with different protected characteristics when policies are being designed, decided and implemented. And this is particularly true in response to the coronavirus emergency. Part of our mandate is to investigate equality and human rights across Great Britain, but data gaps are a real barrier. We must build a robust evidence base to influence policy, inform our strategic priorities and improve people's lives. To do this, we conduct major research projects into pressing issues of inequality and areas in which our human rights are under threat. Last year, we produced a report how coronavirus has affected equality and human rights, which summarised evidence to help us understand the effects of the pandemic on different groups. The report assessed the known key impacts of the pandemic on equality and human rights across five areas of life. These were work, poverty, education, social care and justice. The evidence showed that whilst everyone has been affected by either virus or the restrictions imposed in response to it, the negative impact has been more severe for some groups than others. For example, many older people were deeply affected by the pandemic, particularly those in care homes and those impacted by actions that effectively rationed intensive care on the basis of age. It also affected ethnic minorities and disabled people, 
who faced a double impact of being more likely to die from the virus, while also being more likely to experience financial hardship as a result of the pandemic more broadly. And young people who have experienced significant interruption to their education, with some, for example, those living in digital poverty, having much less access to education provided online. Now, this threatens to widen inequalities for those who already perform less well than their peers. Whilst this report provided valuable evidence of the impact of the pandemic on equality and human rights, it's important to mention the prevalent issue of data gaps and the inconsistency of official data sets in collecting and reporting on protected characteristics and equality. Prior to the pandemic, there were many gaps in the range of protected characteristics that were included in data, or their coverage was inconsistent or used varying categories, characteristics like sexual orientation, older age groups, types of impairment, and some ethnicities were, ethnicities were not routinely covered by many public data sets, giving us a partial picture of what was happening. The pandemic proved an incentive to fill some of those gaps. One notable example is that prior to the pandemic, mortality by characteristics other than age and sex was largely unknown. The Office for National Statistics linked data sets to properly understand the differential rate of mortality for different groups and by disability, a great step forward. This provided a strong evidence base on this particular issue, but there are still a range of data gaps in access to healthcare, criminal justice, education and work. In our view, this is a grave problem. To improve equality and human rights outcomes, we must have access to relevant data that enables us, governments and others, to understand the different experiences and outcomes for certain groups and the underlying reasons behind them. It's simple. If society doesn't know that a problem exists, we can't act to address it. It's essential, therefore, that comprehensive data on protective characteristics is recorded as standard in the data set produced and used across government and the public sector. The requirements of the PSED, um, to, to meet this, the requirements of the PSED, governments and public bodies should set strategic, strategic equality objectives based on the best available data or explain why the available evidence is not relevant in their circumstances. We also recommend that data producers should make sure data is as comprehensive as possible and that they embed good quality, equality analysis within the statistics and any deeper analysis produced as a matter of course. As we look ahead to implementing our next three-year strategic plan, we are aware that emerging digital technologies, including artificial intelligence, have the potential to deliver significant benefits, but could also systematise and embed discriminatory decision-making and present a real risk of excluding some groups. Over the next three years, we'll be working to ensure decision-makers understand how the Equality Act applies to the design and use of automated decision-making and how discrimination that might arise can be identified and challenged before implementation. You must apply this at the concept stage and not once it's already created damage. We'll seek to improve understanding of how the Human Rights Act applies to the use of new technology in terms of privacy and surveillance, things that Diana talked about, the use of data, and ensure that the law is updated in line with the development of new technologies to keep ensuring that we protect people from discrimination and breaches of their rights. The pandemic and the response to it has highlighted the increasing rollout of data-driven policies, algorithms, and automated decision-making by governments and public bodies. It is going to be the future. But they are not always free from potential discriminatory impact, despite their longer term value. Additionally, the lack of protected characteristic data during the pandemic has emphasised the wider issue of data gaps across all areas of our lives. We need this breakdown of data to ensure not just the effective monitoring of the impacts of the coronavirus and the emergency measures, but also the wider outcomes for certain groups in our society and to protect the rights of everyone in good times and bad. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caroline. I think you have highlighted to all of us the huge importance that evidence 
plays in robust policy making and the fact that these data gaps only serve to exacerbate already existing inequalities and gaps within society and that that will only hinder the government's stated commitment of ensuring that we live in a more equal and fair society. I particularly thought your points made about the potential plan for COVID status certifications this winter is incredibly important in that they would have huge impacts on people's freedom of movement and privacy and also liberty and that it's incredibly important that there be recognition of the exemption provisions for those who are unvaccinated. And I think your example of pregnant women is particularly relevant, given that women were too also uh, discriminated against in terms of the furlough scheme uh, for no seemingly justified evidential reason. So we've def- the mistakes have definitely been made, and it is incredibly important and incredibly welcome that regulatory bodies and important departments like the EHRC are playing such an important role in highlighting the lessons that we need to learn from and where we can move forward to in future. So thank you so much, Caroline, for a hugely important and timely presentation to kick off our keynote panel. So for our second speaker on our keynote panel, I am absolutely to, I'm absolutely delighted, excuse me, to introduce Emily Jarrett. Emily is a senior policy advisor at the Center for Data Ethics and Innovation, CDEI, which is part of the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport. She holds an MA in Conflict Security and Development from King's College London and a BA in Philosophy, Politics and Economics from the University of Oxford. Emily was a lead researcher on the COVID Repository and Public Attitudes Report published by CDEI in 2021. And she will be speaking speaking to us today about the use of AI and data-driven technology in the UK's COVID-19 response and the very importance of trustworthy governance. Emily, whenever you're ready, thank you. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Nora. Um, And it's great to be here this morning um, sharing the, albeit virtual stage, with all these wonderful speakers following Professor Coyle's fascinating keynote speech um, to kick off this year's conference. So it's kind of clear to all of us that the pandemic has changed the way in which everyone, and particularly public services, use and share data. Um, And at the height of the pandemic, as you mentioned here at the CDI, we monitored where new data uh, was being put to use throughout the pandemic, um, documenting novel use cases within a database which we called our COVID-19 repository. Um, We saw that new data-driven technologies were not only used to combat the immediate public health crisis, but as Caroline noted in her presentation, were also deployed to mitigate the wider effects of lockdown, not least to keep public services running. Um, You know, from connecting volunteers on social media platforms to identifying treatments and vaccinations for COVID-19, almost every facet of the response required the support of data. Um, And it wasn't necessarily kind of so-called big data or AI that played an outsized role that many expected it would at the start of the pandemic, rather it was more conventional data analysis uh, underpinned by new data sharing agreements that appear to have the biggest, made the biggest difference to the work of public authorities. Now, new data sharing efforts took a variety of forms. Um, In some cases, the government and public services opened up their data sets to the private sector for the first time. So thinking about the access that supermarkets were given to information about vulnerable patients most in need of assistance. And then in other instances, we've seen individual public services pool their data sets to allow for more sophisticated data analysis. So this includes some children's services providers in London who um, chose to collect and combine data on service performance in order to identify early signs of system stress and the ONS linkages that, that Caroline mentioned earlier as well. But our research has also told us that some of the progress that was made, and that's particularly across local government in the last year and a half, may not be sustained without kind of concerted effort and support moving forwards. And our conversations with um, local authority data leads kind of reaffirms that there are a number of deep seated barriers to, to innovation, notably confusion over what is permissible under the law, given that many of those innovations that took place during the pandemic took place under emergency powers. And of course, aside from the legal aspects, as the emergency response the pandemic kind of winds down, there's an associated increased scrutiny on the data ethics of these different programs. Um, So I think we're kind of all aware that there is a huge opportunity and and almost a duty for the public sector to use data to better serve its citizens. And the last year, we've seen how data has been used in unprecedented ways to manage the impact of the pandemic and public engagement that we ran 
um, as part of our repository, suggest that there's now an expectation from the public, um, for the public sector to use data more effectively to deliver services, but, and importantly, to do so in a way that meets high ethical standards. Um, and although the overall picture presented through our polling was very much one of a public that is kind of largely sympathetic and in some cases enthusiastic about how data has been used to tackle the pandemic and how it could be used moving forwards into the future, this has sometimes been in spite of rather than because of the way data has been shared. And this suggests to us that public support is tenuous and somewhat dependent on trust in the governance of technology. And something really key to note is that this is even in the context of the data use having a very clear purpose with relatively obvious positive effects for the public, and this is something that I'll return to, to later. Um, but at the CDI, we believe that enabling access to data for innovation in a trustworthy way will help to overcome a significant barrier to responsible innovation. And in our public attitudes work, actually when we controlled for all other variables, we found that trust in the rules and regulations governing data use was the single biggest predictor of whether someone believed that digital technology had a role to play in the COVID-19 response. And this trust in governance was substantially more predictive than attitude variables such as people's level of concern about the pandemic or their belief that technology would be effective and also demographic variables such as age and education. So given our findings throughout the pandemic, as well as looking at prior research on barriers um, to data sharing in the public sector, at the CDI, we've now started to use trustworthiness as a kind of a lens through which to understand responsible innovation and therefore responsible data sharing, which will lead to implementing data-driven technology and insights in an ethical and ultimately effective way. So when we work with other organizations, we encourage them to think about eight, what we call fundamentals. And so those are accountability, human-centered value, fairness, privacy, safety, security, societal well-being, and transparency. So a lot of the usual suspects there, um, but essentially ensuring that data use has effective governance and oversight, that there are clear lines of responsibility and that those lines of responsibility are open to scrutiny, that the data sharing and use does not inflict undue harms, that it's monitored for fair use and outcomes, that the rights of individuals around their personal data are respected, so including all the many aspects of privacy that Professor Coyle so eloquently spoke about earlier, and that data sharing and data use support beneficial outcomes for society as a whole and not just individuals. Um, so of course we very much understand that for many practitioners both in the public and private sectors concepts like responsible innovation, transparency, accountability um, can seem quite nebulous and therefore quite difficult to achieve and so we hope that by using trustworthiness and data use and data sharing to focus the aims of those terms we can help others understand how we kind of practically achieve quite conceptually complex ideas um, and so our fundamentals work as a means to the end of trustworthiness in, in data sharing technology. Um, of course, there will almost always be some context dependent nuance and trade-offs when we're talking about data sharing, again, as both Caroline and Professor Coyle spoke to earlier, um, which is what makes the conversation around our responsibilities, like the conversation that we're having today and over the next, next day or so, particularly after the shifts caused by a pandemic, even more complex. Um, and as I'm sure everyone here is acutely aware, further complexity in the conversation around responsibility is added to through legal rules and norms. Um, and for us, although legal compliance is something that absolutely underlines all of our work, including, for example, the Equality Act, we see it as a necessary but not sufficient element for working towards trustworthiness. Although legal rules do exist that address aspects of all of our work and all of those fundamentals, fundamentals that I mentioned earlier, they may not be sufficiently broad, clear, or even enforceable for achieving this trustworthiness that we're really looking for in our work. So as we keep moving forwards, we've certainly been seeing the excitement that data use during the pandemic has caused across the public sector with many organizations kind of now focused on continuing this trend and identifying further problems that could be solved through increased data sharing and data driven solutions. Um, but one thing that has stood out as we move further through the pandemic is that sometimes that excitement can lead to a focus on being data driven, but not necessarily defining the problem that the data is solving or a purpose as to why data is being shared. And something that we often find ourselves highlighting is that need for a clear purpose of a data driven project and for enabling that data sharing in the first place, understanding what the end goal is, what the problem, what problem is being solved and why a data driven option is measurably better than the status quo. Um, so this idea of purpose was something that did perhaps seem a bit clearer at the height of the pandemic and the emergency response. But as the focus of pandemic related data use has kind of changed and moved more towards building future resilience than that initial public health response, this clarity of purpose can sometimes slip away a little. And without this purpose, it kind of becomes unclear how we can interrogate data driven projects 
fully and therefore understand our responsibilities, especially given their often context dependent nature. Um, and without a purpose, we can't assess whether the data being shared is appropriate, if the right, right data is even available as we don't know what the right data is, um, or whether or how data sets being used are or could be biased. So for example, that un unconscious bias that Caroline mentioned earlier and how that affects research or a project in the long term. And without a purpose, we can't ensure therefore that data is being shared in a responsible, sustainable and ultimately trustworthy way. So circling right back to the theme of this conference, our rights and responsibilities around data use in a pandemic. Of course, they are there are many, they're varied. There's far more to talk about. Um, we need more than kind of a couple of days to interrogate them. But I'd really like to leave everyone um, with two things at the forefront of their mind. And the first is that fundamental importance of trustworthiness to this successful, effective and sustainable data sharing. And that achieving that trustworthiness often means more than just being lawful. And the second is remembering that although there are many ways in which we can use the data at our fingertips, articulating the way in which you want to and will use that data should always be a first step. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. And I think your points resound very much with everyone that it is definitely not just adequate or sufficient for various measures and government responses in a pandemic or with regard to any other regulatory response that they just be lawful. There is a lot more that needs to be done to gauge the impacts in terms of the point that Caroline rightly raised and Diane before her in terms of evidence-based public evidence-based, excuse me, policy making. And then of course, I mean the very important work that CDI have done on public attitudes. I mean, that is also another very important element, that participatory model of democracy that should be informing government and policy responses as well. That's also hugely important. So Emily, thank you so much for your contribution. Thank you very much. So last but not at all least, our final panelist on today's keynote panel is Gillian Phillips. Gillian is an eminent and globally recognized media law specialist and part-time employment tribunal judge. She has advised on some of the most culturally significant events of recent years. These have included advising the Guardian News Media Limited on phone hacking, WikiLeaks, the Levinson inquiry, the NSA leaks from Edward Snowden and the HSBC files. Gillian studied history and law at Selwyn College, Cambridge, and began her career at Clifford Chance, but soon swapped private practice and corporate life for the media. She spent nine years as an in-house lawyer at the BBC and then moved to news group newspapers, Times Newspapers Limited, and then in 2009 to The Guardian, where she is now Director of Editorial Legal Services for Guardian News and Media, Publishers of The Guardian and Observer Newspapers and TheGuardian.com. And it is on the importance of the right to freedom of expression, one of the core human rights protected under the UK Human Rights Act 1998, that constitutes one of the essential foundations of a democratic society that Gillian will be speaking on today, specifically the impact that emergency legislation and the COVID regulations have had upon assembly rights and the right to protest and freedom of speech. Gillian, whenever you're ready, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm sort of somewhat daunted by the august company in which I find myself and uh, whoever wrote the beginning of your talk of my biography, I should employ them, I think, uh, <laughs> for, for my own purposes. So thank you very much. And yes, I'm going to speak briefly on the sort of use of emergency powers in the pandemic and the impact this had on um, the, the, you know, the fundamental human right of freedom of expression. And in this context, as a as a sort of subsidiary but related matter, the right of assembly and, and protest, as, as Nora has, uh, has mentioned. And, I mean, before I go there, there is, of course, a separate and equally important discussion to be had, as the previous speakers have all really touched on, with regard to the impact of the pandemic on the Art Article 8 right of privacy um, and the rights and obligations created by the GDPR, on the use and processing of personal data. Um, you know, for example, again, it's been touched on by other speakers, vaccination data, test and trace data, COVID certificates. Um, and it's just worth noting in that context that very early on in the pandemic, I think, you know, the 19th of March, 2020, the European Data Protection Board issued a statement on the processing of personal data in the context of the, of the pandemic referencing Article 15 of the Privacy Directive, um, and while acknowledging that data protection rules do not hinder measures taken in the fight against the pandemic, uh, underlining that, the, uh, that data controllers and processors must still ensure 
the protection of the personal data of data subjects. Um, and there's this rather sort of uh, prescient quote, emergency is a legal condition which may legitimize restrictions of freedoms provided these restrictions are proportionate and limited to the emergency period. Um, and that's resonating, I think, um, through what we've, you know, we've been hearing this morning. So um, Professor Coyle, in her, in her very thought-provoking lecture, talked about the utility of data and asked some important questions, even in my world, including, you know, who can use the data? What data can they use? Um, and also emphasised, I thought, very interestingly, the public value of openly available data against the reduction in its its financial value, if you like. You know, interesting concept, um, I think, to apply to how you look at data. And certainly during the pandemic, the flow and control of data, uh, of information about the pandemic itself, what it was, how it was caused, how infectious it was, how it might be controlled, who was being infected. How full were the hospitals? Uh, how many people were dying? All that, all that information came under increasing government control. Um, in some countries, the available of openly accessible, accurate data became a war zone, really. Journalists who tried to find out were threatened, arrested, access to information was restricted and controlled. And the World Health Organization uh, at the time described as a second disease accompanying the pandemic, an infodemic, an, an overabundance of information, some accurate and some not, that made it hard for people to find trustworthy sources and reliable guidance when they needed it. So the, the pandemic brought to the forefront the importance of the media and of access to verified information. Not only did it bring to the fore issues around disinformation and misinformation, which could be considered to be harmful as opposed to necessarily illegal content, all the more so during a pandemic, but it also shone a spotlight on access to the right information. But it went beyond, the pandemic went beyond having an impact on freedom of expression. With lockdowns and limitations on movement, it impacted on the right of assembly, the right to protest and so forth. Let me start at the beginning with a, with a very brief human story that illustrates well, I think, the significance of information in a pandemic. In February 2020, Chinese ophthalmologist Li Wenling died of COVID-19 in Wuhan. He was an eye doctor who raised the alarm about China's coronavirus outbreak. He died after contracting COVID-19 while treating patients in Wuhan. At the end of December 2019, Dr. Lee sent a message to fellow doctors in a chat group, warning them about a disease that looked like SARS and advising they wear protective clothing to avoid infection. Three days later, the police paid him a visit and told him to stop making false comments. He was investigated for spreading rumours. He returned to work, caught the virus from a patient, and three weeks later, he was dead. Um, and one of the worries about the pandemic is that it created overreaching state power. It allowed it to go forward. Uh, and the state in some countries, indeed many countries, abused that power, not only to restrict the flow of information about the pandemic itself, but also more widely to prevent dissent, to crack down on protest, to influence elections, etc. A 2020 report by the then UN Special Rapporteur for Opinion and Expression, David Kaye, highlighted that access to information, independent media and other free expression rights were critical to meeting the challenges of the pandemic. That report, along with guidance on COVID-19 issued by the Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights, advised that relevant information about COVID-19 should reach all people, that there should be internet access to essential information, and that journalists and the media should be able to report on the pandemic without fear or censorship. The familiar term freedom of expression actually encompasses a lot of rights. It's not simply an individual's right to speak, although that is at the heart of it, but it's also a collective right of society to receive and listen. It encompasses the right to seek, the right to receive, and the right to impart information and ideas of all kinds. So the right of the listener, as well as the speaker, is protected. You will all be familiar with the concept that human rights can be roughly divided into absolute and qualified rights. 
and that qualified rights are open to limitations, which mean that states can justify interferences, for for instance, in the interest of public health, provided that certain conditions are met. And under most international conventions that govern human rights, restrictions of qualified rights, such as free expression and the right of assembly, must generally be provided by law, pursue a legitimate aim, protect a legitimate interest, suitable to achieving that aim, necessary and reasonable. And, and that's all language that most of us who operate in this sphere, you know, can sort of, you know, it's there. It's the, th- the things that you, you take all the time. And if we look at the, you know, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article 19 uh, is the right to freedom of expression. Article 21 is the right of peaceful assembly. And both of those have the qualified language that we expect, that we've come to, to, to live and work with that allow for restrictions in certain in certain situations. And we can see similar qualified language in the equivalent rights in the European Convention on, on Human Rights. So both Articles 19 and 21 of the ICCPR uh, are qualified rights, which allow, even in the normal course of events, for the imposition of limits on them to protect the rights and reputations of other, national security, public order, public health or morals. Um, And the balancing of rights is another theme that's been touched on um, by by other speakers, the proportionality of of restrictions. And and it's an approach that, again, uh, most people operating in an international human rights context will be very familiar with. But but what the pandemic did was brought into sharp focus that in times of public emergency, there are stronger, more draconian restrictions which can be imposed by states. And Article 4 of the ICCPR, for example, states that in time of public emergency, which threatens the life of the nation and the existence of which is officially proclaimed, states may take measures derogating from their obligations under the under the covenant. In other words, they can suspend the obligations altogether. Um, And it's pretty clear that a number of states took advantage of that, even if they didn't properly notify the the UN about their the notification of the public emergency Um, and even if there is a lot of argument about whether the pandemic actually meets the criteria of uh, a public emergency threatening the life of nations um, that's another topic altogether for other people to uh, to engage in Um, and and um, so so this emergency power you know goes much further than the balancing role that we we've been discussing and which normally as we've said, sort of pervades the uh, the, the debate about this uh, thing. And it was considered entirely legitimate um, to, temporary der- to temporarily derogate from obligations such as freedom of expression and the right to assembly. And the Human Rights Committee, which uh, when it's looking at the ICCPR, uh, has some general comments and advice and guidance on interpreting uh, those, those, those provisions. Uh, sets out some guidance around how Article 4 powers might be used. It sets out, for example, that measures derogating from the provisions must be of an exceptional and temporary nature. Uh, And there's not time to go into all the details in General Comment 29. But before a state moves to invoke Article 4, the situation must amount to a public emergency which threatens the life of the nation and the state party must have officially proclaimed a state of emergency. And there are, there are many imp- serious interpretive questions arising as to, as I say, whether the pandemic met the definition. But there is no doubt that we saw the use of the pandemic to impose much tighter state control, using the pandemic as justification. And, and what came out of this as a response to the restricted availability of information Um, and concerns about the origins of the information uh, and its accuracy, was that in many places the public appears to have sought out alternative routes to information. For example, just talking from The Guardian's perspective, the number of unique visitors to The Guardian website almost doubled from 191 million visitors to The Guardian uh, in February 2020, which was in itself a record, uh, to 366 million in March. So, you know, almost a double leap just over that month with people looking, I think, for for information that they felt, going back to another theme that's coming out from the panelists, trustworthiness about about information. 
Um, and those increased visits went hand in hand with many more web pages being viewed. Um, some media online in response to the pandemic dropped their paywalls uh, and provided open access to coverage of the pandemic. And even the, the social media giants, Facebook, Google and others, issued a joint statement on their commitment to fight coronavirus related misinformation. So it, it needs to be recognised that a lot of information um, and misinformation and disinformation it, it, it is derived from the less accountable, less transparent big technology firms who, of course, set their own rules and standards um, to an extent where it can be said that, that they may be more powerful and have more control than states themselves as a sort of global gatekeepers of information. And when Facebook or Google decide whether to leave information up online or take it down, they're making decisions on free speech based on private standards that don't necessarily reflect the international speech standards and safeguards that I've touched on. Uh, and there are moves afoot by the Online Safety Bill and the Digital Safety Act in Europe you know, to make these big tech firms more accountable over their decisions on information. And I think where all this leaves us is the vitally important role played or to be played by professional journalism, which is or should be transparent and accountable publishing verified facts and informed opinion and providing the public with a clear alternative to disinformation, helping to disprove falsehoods as well as exposing the limitations of a lot of state narrative around the pandemic. Nevertheless, the reliance on the commercial marketplace for information, which, as Professor Coyle has indicated, places and may seek to extract a financial value from data, raises, of course, its own separate questions around accuracy, transparency, accountability and trustworthiness. Thanks. Thanks so much, Gillian. I think you've given a hugely powerful account of the impact that both the pandemic itself and, of course, the, the nature of the pandemic in terms of being this airborne disease you know, immediately had for just any public interactions and private interactions, and of course, the immediate effect that that would have on the right to protest and any public activities of that nature. But of course, I think you very rightly highlighted that with any introduction of emergency powers and in an ongoing health public security crisis, both national and internationally as we have, that there have indeed been incidents of overreach by, by states. And I think this links back again to an important point that Emily also raised, and that is one of the key questions of lawfulness not being the overall silver bullet or, or key test for what is acceptable in a democratic society in terms of restrictions on rights. There is, of course, you know, the qualified restriction on particular rights like privacy and freedom of expression, as you highlighted, Gillian. But of course, they must be lawful. They must be for a legitimate aim, as you rightly pointed out. And I think uh, often quite crucially, the, the crux of a lot of these laws and rules fall on what's actually proportionate, what's actually strictly necessary in a democratic society. And there have certainly been some some questions that have been raised over the past 18 months as to how proportionate some measures have been. For instance, the, 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 the factor of there being a protest that causes noise. I mean, one has to wonder about the certain thresholds that have been set in terms of completely restricting what is a hugely important human right that is essential to the functioning of a open democracy that is to be transparent and accountable. And I thought the point that you raised in particular about the infodemic being the second disease that's accompanied the pandemic itself is, is hugely important. There have been massive challenges for governments and also industry in terms of grappling and, and dealing with the challenges of so much disinformation that have come from so many different quarters and this is a hugely important issue and I think it's very important too as you highlight that professional journalism plays its role in not just speaking truth to power in all forms of different organizations public and private but also in 
providing a very important role in addressing disinformation as it is in the wider public arena. So thanks so much, Gillian. I think that highlights a hugely important area where the pandemic has definitely infringed upon individual rights. And in terms of all of the presentations this morning, I think there are some very important key themes that emerge and that also link back as well to Diane's presentation this morning. And a lot of that seems to be key to the access of trustworthy information, which would be one of the key elements. And then also, secondly, there being access given to appropriate organizations in terms of getting value from that data, assessing data gaps, but also ensuring that assessing the effectiveness and evaluating the impacts of those rules is also taken into account, especially when we have an ongoing cycle as we do with the pandemic. That's hugely important. And also that the role of the big technological platforms are taken into account. Um, Julian raised the point that they are effectively now global gatekeepers of information when we think about some very significant international tech companies such as Facebook, such as Apple, such as Google. And that kind of power imbalance needs to be taken into account, especially when we think about freedom of information and upcoming legislative proposals such as online safety and also Caroline raised an important point in terms of the oversight of the effectiveness of these measures, that parliamentary oversight is key, and also objective evidence is also very important too in terms of assessing impact and evaluation. Thanks everybody who has attended um, this morning and come back for more this afternoon. We've already had some very interesting uh, discussions today. Um, just a bit of context, I guess, on, on this panel. We're going to be talking um, about trustworthy governance in a pandemic, which is a very big topic because governance, of course, covers many things, uh, not just privacy and data protection uh, and uh, public um, use of, of data in a public, emerg public health emergency, but of course, many other things that will flow from this situation, future uses of data collected during the, the pandemic, issues potentially to do with um, anonymization and pseudonymization and other, other measures that might be introduced to protect individuals uh, whose data have been collected and are continuing to be collected. The other, the other introductory comment I would make is that um, we're now 20 months um, past the point when the World Health Organization upgraded the COVID-19 uh, situation from a, a public health emergency of international significance to a pandemic. And there was some controversy, you may recall at the time, as to why they waited so long indeed to do that once cases had spread from Asia to Europe and the United States and pretty much everywhere else. Uh, but I, I'm looking back on these rather weird uh, 20 months we've had. Um, I attended many meetings, uh, conferences. I uh, observed parliamentary committees receiving evidence. I read lots of submissions from civil societies and regulators about some very specific issues um, arising from the pandemic in relation to data, and in particular personal data. And these included um, things like uh, immunization status, uh, certificates, and restrictions on people who couldn't prove, for example, they were vaccinated or had uh, recovered recently from, from an infection or had a recent negative COVID test uh, and so on. Um, through to lots of discussion about uh, what employers and employer employees should be doing about this and what employee rights might be. And I think that uh, between March 2020 and about the time of last year's annual conference, actually, there was a massive amount of attention paid to that. And a lot of really interesting ideas came out. There was a lot of controversy. My sense is then there was a bit of fatigue set in and uh, there was relatively little focus on this. Um, at, but it's come back very much as a hot topic uh, in the context of the, uh, well, to say something reasonably local or regional in the context of the current wave in Europe and some quite severe, I, I won't necessarily call them draconian because that sounds uh, like I'm jumping to a conclusion, but severe measures adopted by governments just this week in a number of countries in Western Europe in response to uh, an acceleration in case numbers and uh, pressure on public health uh, 
uh, services. So this is very much a hot topic. The great thing I think uh, about this panel is that we are looking more broadly than the immediate public health data issues to some of the broader societal implications of what is happening. Now, I'm very sorry uh, to say that one of our panelists is unable to, to join us due to an urgent personal matter, but Dr. Judith Townend was going to be talking about a very specific impact of the uh, pandemic on the uh, justice system and what we really know and don't know about what's happening in terms of um, the, the processing of cases and the impact on the prompt and fair administration of justice. So hopefully we will get to read uh, some of her work on that separately. But in the meantime, we have lots to talk about and we're very fortunate to have um, speakers from, uh, from Singapore and from uh, the UK. And uh, first up actually is going to be uh, Lee Minong and Mark Findlay from the uh, National, from Singapore Management University, who've been working on a fascinating project um, on finding out uh, what public attitudes and concerns are in relation to the future use of data. They've been running a, an interdisciplinary study, and um, indeed, they they published a, a report uh, uh, on this. Um, sorry, I've, I've got a bit out of I've got a bit out of sequence there. That was that was really part of of Rachel's uh, context as well. Um, but coming back to Lee Min and Mark, their work uh, on the Pandemic Surveillance Society, Emerging Emergency Responses or the New Normal, I think is extremely um, timely and, and in some ways provocative. So it's widely discussed that uh, when governments introduce crisis measures in response to an emergency, it could be a war, it could be a public health emergency, it could be some environmental uh, disaster. There is a tendency for new measures to become uh, not just temporary emergency crisis response measures, but to become part of the institutional fabric. And uh, governments seem to have many uh, arguments they can bring forward. They say, well, we need to be ready for national security re measure, reasons for the next uh, security crisis, or we need to be preparing now for the next pandemic. And this data we've been collecting in the context of COVID-19 may turn out to be extremely relevant and useful. So I think it's important that we do look at uh, what's happening to uh, public attitudes, government positions on what should be done from now on. Uh, and, and this crisis, of course, is by no means over. And many things uh, could happen that could make it even more complex and uh, raise even more issues in terms of public sector and private sector collection of data, data in response to the uh, health crisis. But looking to the future, what uh, are people expecting? What would be reasonable? Uh, what concerns should um, civil society groups, regulators, legislators, um, and others be raising to uh, ensure that data are handled uh, appropriately um, on an ongoing basis? So I want to hand over now to to, to Lee Min, who I think will be presenting first, and uh, be great to get some comments from Mark as well. And we do have a little bit more time now, so no need to rush. If you want to take 15 to 20 minutes to cover this, that would be great. Over to you. Thanks. Okay. Hi again. I'm Lee Min. Um, our presentation today is on pandemic surveillance societies. This is an area that I've taken over. And the work that we are presenting today is based on two papers coming up from our center. Uh, it's written by a former colleague of mine, uh, Alicia Wee, and also by Mark, who's here with us today. So this is the outline of um, today's presentation. First of all, um, the common theme is trust. We, are, we will first look at um, public trust and confidence during a pandemic how COVID measures uh, put a strain on public trust. And we will draw some examples from Singapore. We will look at how trust deficit has a significant impact on control strategies. And finally, as we move on to the new normal, what does this mean for surveillance post-pandemic? First of all, um, trust in a state of non-emergency pre-pandemic um, is the foundation of an effective response during a crisis. We envisage that trust um, is a relationship between the individual data subject 
and the data harvester or the controller. Now, during the pandemic, um, trust is being qualified by the rights compromise or a trade-off argument. Emergency justifications are being used when deploying surveillance, um, such as in contact tracing apps, but do they actually work and um, does it make us safer? The public's trust um, has an impact on the efficacy and legitimacy of COVID controls. Um, trust is also important to ensure that people comply with uh, the control measures. And this is uh, dependent on, uh, trust is dependent on citizen inclusion in principled design. In the absence of trust, it is more likely that app uptake, the downloads, uh, will be denied. Um, trust as regulation is a concept um, that, our, uh, that our center has developed. Um, it is built on Roger Cotterell's work on law and community. Um, it is a complex notion, but we are just putting it um, out there for you to consider. Um, it is the idea that trust uh, can be regulation itself. Um, it's the idea that trust establishes social relationships and those become the norm, uh, which then affects behavior and outcomes. So we are proposing that AI needs to be located within the community um, to generate trust uh, within a community by being designed and being developed for the community it serves. Trust is however also complex and among other things, um, it would also be impacted by the perception of the public. For example, by things like uh, failures in the technology or by policy exclusion, these things would impact trust. In Singapore, we see um, three main themes in the deployment of the contact tracing app. Uh, the contact tracing app in Singapore is called Trace Together. Uh, first of all, it was initially voluntary. Uh, the download was voluntary and uh, it was privacy proof in that um, the privacy policy was being stressed right from the beginning. Then there were revelations that revealed that this was not the case. And now finally in Singapore, we're in a situation in which track and trace and safe entry, they are both combined and now mandatory. In our first paper, uh, we've surveyed uh, the community response globally. And we have found that um, the community response can be distilled into six main themes of disquiet such as disquiet about the data that's being collected about them, um, disquiet over infringements of rights and liberties, uh, privacy. And there were also concerns raised about uncertainties over the new normal. So back to Trace Together. Um, so in Singapore, when the app was being deployed, we started from a position of trust. The contact tracing app's privacy policy was emphasized. Contact tracing data would only be stored on individuals' phones and only the health ministry could access it if someone tests positive for COVID. Then there were revelations in early this year that data could actually be used for criminal investigations. The minister in charge admitted that he had not thought about the criminal procedure code then he emphasized that Singapore was controlling the pandemic well. Further justifications were made as to why the police had to be given access to the data, and which is mainly to ensure the safety and security of Singaporeans. Um, unsurprisingly, there was a public outcry to these revelations. There were feelings of betrayal. And following that, the government then moved to amend the legislation to specify that contact tracing data can only be used to investigate the most severe offenses, such as murder. Now today, Trace Together is mandatory and it is combined with safe entry, such that the app is now needed in order to access public spaces everywhere, like food courts, shopping malls, supermarkets. And so there is public acceptance of this technology through compulsion. 
And what does this um, show us about the impact of trust deficit on control strategies? So some ways in which um, it can manifest include a low app uptake, especially if it's a voluntary basis. It could manifest in protests. And in Singapore's case, um, the decision was to then to make a uh, forced compliance through compulsory uptake of the app. Now, even if downloading the app is made compulsory, nevertheless, the community can still show and express their disquiet in various ways, such as by deleting the app or disabling Bluetooth. What this shows us is that um, it is important to resolve the community disquiet and to restore citizens' trust. We propose that there is a causal connection between trust and the overall efficiency and utility of control measures employed. We also caution that community distrust would bleed into suspicions or doubts concerning the state's role in wider surveillance and mass data sharing. Therefore, by resolving um, the disquiet and by restoring trust, uh, we believe this would lead to more positive outcomes by having more engaged, uh, engaged citizens and through accountable data use by the authorities. Um, in our second paper on digital contact tracing, uh, we first sought to test our view that trust deficit was a key variable affecting um, and constraining the efficacy of COVID control. We employed a comparative method examining the contact tracing app uptake in UK and Germany. These jurisdictions were chosen because of um, their political similarities in that they have a high compliance to the rule of law and uh, representative democracies. But more interesting to us was that these two countries both started from very different positions of trust when the contact tracing app was rolled out. The UK started from a position of low trust, while Germany, which invested in citizen inclusion during the process, um, started from a higher position of trust. Our analysis showed that over time, both countries, however, ended up in the same position of failure in the app up uptake. On the screen here, we have identified uh, some external factors that have influence over the community's trust and consequently the app uptake. Um, so some examples will include uh, technical failures and also alienating some users who were on older phone models and just in general, the overhyping of the contact tracing technology. So uh, from our second paper, um, our initial findings are that, first of all, trust is relational, trust is multi-layered, especially when we're thinking about the uh, relationship between humans and machines. Trust is fluctuating, um, so it's quite volatile as well. Uh, it is not consistently influential on the efficiency of technology. So as we can see, it, trust is not independent. Um, there are external factors also at play. However, what we have observed is that if trust is strained or absent, this is likely to have an impact. Distrust may be the real variable and consequently will harm the possible productive social bonds between people and technology. Um, this is the new normal, uh, we are moving to the new normal, this is what it looks like. Um, we are living with both the virus and the technology. We are working from home. We are experiencing differentiated measures, different privileges for those who are vaccinated. Uh, mass data sharing is also an important subject which we will need to discuss. Uh, finally, so what does this all mean for the future, especially with smart cities on the rise? So AI tech and big data um, are what makes cities smart. And we are seeing the fusion of public and private governance. So if mass surveillance uh, becomes the new normal, how can this still be justified when uh, it was originally meant to tackle crisis? What we do know is that the public's trust is a crucial variable to look at. And with that, we look forward to your questions.
to, to bring in next though is Mark. Do you have anything you want to add to that at this stage? Um, no, I just uh, thank Lee Min for a masterful summary of about two years of solid work. Um, what we tried to do with that combination of those two papers is to show how our research progressed as the trust fluctuated through different communities. So the early research was done very, uh, you know, uh, much on a, a sort of simple causal um, arrangement of thinking, trust, efficacy, success. And then we realised through looking at a variety of different jurisdictions, particularly jurisdictions where social capital wasn't necessarily based on trust, like China, we found that there was a much more nuanced, much more interesting, much more unpredictable involvement between trust and outcomes. Also, what became very clear was that this is not just a question about what communities think or how even the technology performs, but also because of political variables. You know, things that came to play in the study that we did on the UK which were very, very idiosyncratic, but relative to the political impetus of the day. So I think the one thing that we distilled out of all of this was that the community has a role in legitimating the way in which control goes forward. And that's the same for, uh, you know, whatever the post-pandemic will be, because if we're moving into a society where we've become more numb to surveillance then there might be an active responsibility on those of us who are concerned about that to go back to stimulate questions about positive trust and distrust. So the communities are not just lost in this sense of, uh, uh, you know, incapacity that life will go on in a way which they had never predicted before. So trust is important, but it's important to realise how incredibly varied and context-specific it is. That's great. Thank you very much indeed. Um, okay, let's let's press on. I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Rachel Alsop as our next speaker. Um, Rachel's a lecturer at Northumbria University School of Law, and her research is also right up to date because from January to October of this year, she was um, a research fellow on the a project called the Observatory for Monitoring Data-Driven Approaches to COVID-19, uh, OMDAC. I don't know whether you pronounce the double D differently in the middle, but you can correct me on that. Um, so again, it's, it's fantastic to have sort of state-of-the-art knowledge uh, brought to this discussion. And so I uh, won't take any more of your time. Over to you, Rachel. Thank you for having me today. Um, my, as Christopher said, my name's Rachel Orsop and I'm based in the law school at Northumbria University. And between January and October this year, I was research fellow on the AAC funded project entitled uh, the long name Observatory for Monitoring Data Driven Approaches to COVID-19, uh, which we've shortened to OMDAC. Um, and our project investigated the legal, ethical, policy and operational challenges with a view to collating the lessons learned about data-driven approaches to the pandemic in the UK specifically. Um, and in this talk, I'm going to discuss just a few of our key findings and recommendations, which really emphasise the importance, we think, of trustworthy governance um, for the use of data post-pandemic. And one of our main recommendations sort of stresses the importance of robust, meaningful end-to-end -end information governance um, in terms of data acquisition, sharing and processing with that governance centrally being transparent to the public to ensure that level of public confidence and trust. Um, but I'll just start with a quick word on the methods that we applied. So we used a mixed methods approach in the project. And, um, and that involved interviews with key stakeholders who had expertise or experience in um, data-driven pandemic responses. We also did some case study analysis on specific data-driven approaches and produced some snapshot reports. Um, we looked at things like the, the contact tracing app, vaccine passports, as well as the creation of new um, combined uh, data sets and across um, policing and local authorities and, and, and public health more generally. And we ran uh, two public perception surveys to try and understand public preferences regarding the sharing of data um, during the pandemic, which I'll come back on to in a little while. Um, and we also engage with young people with the help of a children's human rights charity called Investing in Children. Um, and that was to try and incorporate the voice of the child as regards data-driven approaches and um, 
Well, I won't say any more about that today. My colleague, Dr. Claire Besson, will be giving a presentation on it tomorrow. So you might want to, um, to log in and watch that as well, because that's got really some fascinating insights um, that came out from that part of the project. Um, but importantly, I wanted to highlight as well the interdisciplinary nature of, of OMDAC. So it was a collaboration between the law school, uh, the computing and information science department and the mathematics department in Northumbria. And also the Royal United Services Institute, a defence and security think tank. So it involved researchers really across a number, a real range of disciplines, which was really an element that was really important to the design of this study. So everyone was involved um, in decision making at all stages of, of the project. Uh, the interviews were conducted in interdisciplinary pairs to, to try and benefit from the range of experience and expertise and facilitate sort of broader, more rich insights, hopefully to achieve that kind of real world impact that we were looking for. And, um, and also as well, to clarify what I mean when I'm talking about data driven. So at the start, we, at the interviews we did at the start, um, we really took a steer from stakeholders and left it deliberately open um, to find out sort of what their interpretation of the term data driven was. And what we found actually was that the term was being interpreted really widely, as you can see from the first quote on the slide there. We found there was a spectrum of interpretation from really quite, you know, sophisticated, advanced uses of, of um, machine learning or AI and um, new technologies, all the way through to the more fundamental use of data itself and the application of traditional statistics um, to assist in pandemic related decision making, which was always really interesting. And that sort of wider understanding was applied to our study going forward. And then the second quote I've got on the slide there is an illustrative example of some of the ways in which data was used in this particular case by local authorities during the pandemic. So uh, as you can see, it was about bringing lots of different data sets together from different authorities um, and stakeholders for a much more connected up, uh, joined up response to enable a full picture of members of the community to be gained. Um, and try and identify individuals who need support and then sort of direct that support accordingly. And the stakeholders that, that we spoke to were actually generally really positive about sort of the new ways and progress that the field had been able to make um, in, in using data that, that they felt served the community and highlighted, you know, lots of benefits of ways of working in this way. And they were of the, of the opinion that a lot of, a lot of that would hopefully continue post-pandemic. And that position is something that's also supported, particularly in the UK government's national data strategy, which, which explicitly says, you know, it says the coronavirus pandemic showed how much can be achieved when government departments and wider public sector share vital information to solve problems quickly. And then they go on to say, uh, we have a duty to maintain that high watermark after the pandemic and will implement major and radical changes in the way that the government uses data to drive innovation and productivity across the UK. So it definitely seems that there's this clear intention to build upon sort of the progress that's apparently being made um, during the pandemic after this emergency, hopefully. But the findings of our survey, um, surveys that we did sort of draw attention to a potential tension with what the strategy sets out and maybe what the public are comfortable with in terms of their data. So uh, during the course of the project, we also ran to surveys to understand the public's willingness to share data um, in response to the pandemic and also understand the different factors, how they, how they affect people's willingness to share their data. So we conducted two separate surveys, the first one of which looked at medical data and mobility data, and the second one looked at a specific health surveillance technique um, known as wastewater sampling. That's a technique which um, determines prevalence of COVID-19 in different geographical areas by testing wastewater so that it can inform decision making um, and hopefully de determine whether any public health measures are needed to be implemented. So I'm just going to share some of the results of each of the survey um, and highlight some of the similarities that we found. So the first survey, we asked participants their preferences to share um, data in certain scenarios, as you can see set out on the slide there. So the first scenario looked at the COVID-19 alert level. Um, so level, level five was the highest or the most serious level. The second scenario um, is the data type. 
So we asked about medical data, which was like health type data that the NHS might hold. Um, and also mobility data, which is data relating to where a participant's been and, and when. So telecoms data or um, maybe Google's information from Google. Um, and the third is who's the data being shared with. So we asked them about the local authority, their public health body, uh, the regional police force, and also a fictional commercial company that we made up called Info Insights. And then fourthly, we um, included a scenario about where the data was identifiable or anonymous. And um, so the graph you can see here illustrates the effect of each scenario on preferences. So for each scenario, we're estimating how preference changes if we sort of switched one setting to another. And the dotted line you can see there relates to the reference scenario, which is in brackets at the top of each box there. So for the first box, the reference is alert level one. And an estimate which lies on the right and indicates a greater preference to share, where an uh, estimate which lies on the left is, is a, a lesser preference to share than the, compared to the reference. So in this particular, uh, on these results, you can see that the participants were more willing to share the data as the alert level increased or was higher. They were also more willing to share their medical data as compared with mobility data, which we thought was quite interesting given medical data is often thought of as sort of the more sensitive type of data. The data holder was also really important. Um, participants were more willing to share with their public health body um, or their local authority as compared with the commercial company and indeed the regional police force, which actually we found little preference between their preference for sharing um, with a commercial company or a regional police force. And then also they were more willing to share where it was anonymous as compared with identifiable. Um, so the second survey was the wastewater survey that we um, that I mentioned before. So that this shows the results. Um, and as you can see, some of the scenarios were similar as to what we used in the medical or mobility data survey. The additional one would be the uh, that we included was the coverage. So that refers to um, it's the second the second scenario on the slide there that refers to how sort of granular um, the data is able to indicate as so um, it went from street level through to a state to town or city to county. Um, and as you can see on the results there, part participants were more willing to share their wastewater data where the alert level was higher again, um, where the geog geographical coverage was more broad, so like county level, then down the town or city level. And also, Similarly, we're more happy to share with the public health body or the local authority um, as compared with the police force or the commercial company. So what was interesting to us um, when we brought the survey results together was how similar the estimates are, especially for the alert level and, and the data holder. So that kind of suggests that the context under which data sharing is requested is hugely important. Um, given that the COVID-19 situation and the organisation that participants preferred stayed the same, and it was consistent, irrespective of the type of data that was being shared. And that was interesting as well, especially given that wastewater is largely actually considered to be a, a form of non-personal data, although that is slightly debatable, but generally it's thought to be kind of less intrusive than, um, than other types of data. And a key point that we've drawn from this is that it can't be assumed that the public are comfortable with their data being shared across all sections of the public sector, especially going forward as we begin to come out of this pandemic, hopefully, and that the level of emergency um, reduces. This was something as well that was acknowledged by some of the interviews that we, interviewees that we spoke to, um, who emphasised the importance of public engagement going forward regarding future uses of data so as not to make assumptions about public acceptability and to ensure public trust. Um, one interviewee said, <clears throat> I'm careful about making assumptions because we do have a particular license to continue to do things safely. It's vital that we maintain public confidence in how we're using data, both during the pandemic and afterwards. And as part of our recommendations um, that we made in our final report, we highlight the importance of not making assumptions that the public are comfortable with sharing their data across all sections of the public sector, um, particularly when, uh, which should be taken into account when sort of conceptualising a data sharing programme or um, at the design stage as well. 
And also fundamentally, um, it highlights the need for transparency around data sharing initiatives, which make clear what data is being used and who it's being shared with, and also um, fundamentally the purpose that, that and the context around the, the data use and data sharing. Um, so as part of that as well, we see uh, really central the central importance of robust governance processes being very strongly underlined by these findings. Specifically, um, set out here is in relation to information governance. So this is one of the recommendations that I've pulled from our final report. Um, and it's got a few sort of sections and key elements to it. The first of which is the importance of robust, what we've called end-to-end -end integrated information governance procedures, which include um, but extend beyond data protection to include, for example, human rights assessments. Um, and we've said this shouldn't be a tick box exercise, but it should be a living process which begins sort of right at the outset from the concept design stage um, and is revisited regularly throughout the life cycle of data use, keeping the information governance teams in the loop right the way throughout, essentially. And we also recommend uh, that government and other public bodies are prepared to enforce, to impose legally enforceable limitations or uh, some kind of ring fencing mechanism whether that's enshrined in kind of a statute or another legal protection which restricts use of certain kinds of data. And, and central to all of that is that the information governance and these governance provisions, as well as any legal restrictions or controls and, and levels of scrutiny, are communicated transparently to the public so that they have confidence that their data is being used uh, appropriately and safely. Uh, and finally, another recommendation that I've pulled out as well um, all of the findings that I've talked about so far uh, sort of demonstrate the complexity of the issues involved in the use of data for decision making, as well as sharing data across multiple public sector authorities. It's um, set and it highlights the central importance of kind of integrity, robust information governance and public transparency, um, which are emphasised for creating an environment where such data analysis and sharing can be trusted and accepted. So. In conclusion, in the report, we suggest that these obligations should be reinforced by some kind of uh, regulatory oversight mechanism through the appointment of an emergency independent oversight body with, which has particular responsibilities. Um, and this recommendation in our report actually applies more widely. So it's not just about personal, um, personal individual data, but also the use of aggregate statistics and, uh, which is used to justify policy decisions, um, more widely as well, and how how they um, first how the data is first of all used and communicated to the public, um, and all of these responsibilities would go towards ensuring ultimately that that there is that public trust and making sure that the use of data is ethical and uh, and serves the public good. So that that's been a very quick overview of, of one of the areas that we focused on during the project. Um, you can find all of our publications snapshot reports, the final report and some practitioner guidelines that we put together on OMDAC's website. Um, but thank you very much for listening. So huge thank you to, to Lee Min and Mark and Rachel and Lorna for a fascinating panel. And thanks to everybody who's attended. And uh, I'll hand back to you, Nora. Thanks so much, Christopher. Well, that was just a fantastic panel. Thanks so much to Christopher for his fantastic chairing and moderation and huge thanks as well to our discussant Lorna Woods. And of course, a very big thank you to our speakers. The papers you presented were fascinating and they've just addressed and examined a huge range of very rich issues and questions, everything from oversight and surveillance and safeguards and also international and comparative. So you've really set an incredibly high bar for the rest of the academic panels, but I'm sure they'll look forward to diving more into your research and your papers like, like I am and the rest of the attendees. So thanks so much. And we now have a quick coffee break, but I hope everyone can come back and join us for the next academic panel that Christopher mentioned on state surveillance and the rule of law. Thanks so much, everybody. Right. Hello, everybody. Um, can you all hear me OK? Yep. Excellent. Great stuff. That's always a good start. So uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name's um, Peter Coe. I'm, I'm chairing this excellent panel that we have today on state surveillance and the rule of law. Um, I'm from the School of Law at the University of Reading. 
And I'm also an Associate Research Fellow at the Institute of Advanced Legal Studies and the Information Law and Policy Centre. So it's uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and it's a great honour to be asked to, um, to chair this, this panel. And we've got three really fascinating papers um, for you all today. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about them. Uh, and the order that we'll be, we'll be going in. So uh, our first paper is from Vishav Priya Kohli, who uh, is from Copenhagen Business School. And her paper is on who is monitoring the monitors, health monitoring systems, certification and passports. Vishav's paper will be followed by a paper from Amir Kahane, who is a research fellow at the Federman Cybersecurity Center at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. And Amir's paper is entitled Israel's SIGINT Oversight Ecosystem, COVID-19 Secret Location Tracking as a Test Case. And then last but definitely not least, we've got Dr. Wenlong Lee, who is a postdoctoral research fellow in law, ethics and computers at the University of Birmingham, and Dan Yang, who is a senior legal counsel at the Great Wall uh, Motor Company Limited. And their paper is on Myriad Faces Up for Grabs, Governing fi Facial Data Scrapping for Law Enforcement Agencies. Um, we were then meant to have uh, Dr. Judith Townend um, from the University of Sussex as our discussant, but unfortunately, uh, Judith's daughter is unwell, so she can't make it today. So I'm going to be stepping in for Jude. Um, I, I, I'm going to tell you now, I'm not going to do anywhere near as good a job as Judith would do. Um, so what that means is, is that usually each paper, each, each um, uh, uh, panelist will have around about 15 minutes per paper, but you've got a little bit longer uh, if you need it, because obviously Judith is not here. Although, as I've said, I'll do my best to uh, to step in. So without further ado, um, would you like to start, Bishop? Yes. Uh, so I'm Vishwa Priya Kohli. I'm an assistant professor at Copenhagen Business School. And thank you very much. Uh, I'm to be part of this conference. Uh, I'm going to talk about who is monitoring the monitors. And uh, my plan is to identify what I mean by health monitoring systems and then what I mean by monitors. But my focus will be on five key issues. And then I'll try and offer some uh, preliminary conclusions. So when I talk, when I refer to health monitoring systems, what I mean is the digital health passes. Recently in June, the um, EU passed the regulation on a framework for issuance, verification, and acceptance of interoperable COVID-19 vaccination test and recovery certificates. In short, we call them the EU Digital COVID Certificate, as most of you would know. Uh, and the purpose was to facilitate free movement during the pandemic. So these are known by various names like digital green certificates and COVID passports and so on. Uh, but I've grouped them together as digital health passes. So uh, it's undeniable that there are various advantages of having digital health passes. For example, it probably should and will encourage people to get vaccinated. It has allowed for a gradual reopening of the economy in key sectors such as the food sector. We are allowed to go to restaurants. We are seeing more people going shopping. In the entertainment sector, we are going to cinemas now and we are also attending football matches and sports events. And there's a definite trend of traveling more, at least within the EU. It's also hoped that the consumers would uh, are likely to rejoin or engage in commercial activities and recreational activities. Another advantage of digital health passes is that it provides critical tracking and tracing capabilities. What it has resulted in is that now we are having, sorry, I skipped a slide. Yeah, so we have developed monitors outside the main um, framework that we've, we've always had. So usually we would have government employees or government bodies acting as monitors, uh, for example, at passport control. But now we see that restaurant owners, they check our COVID pass. Our entry into sports halls is also regulated by showing our COVID pass. At shopping centers, we have to show our digital health certificates, likewise at bars, cafes, 
and also at cinemas. So we are turning all the, the people who work at these centers and places into monitors. Uh, and there are some key issues of concern here. Uh, when I'm voicing the concerns, it is with reference to the digital health certificates and the process in which it came into being. So the first issue that I have is that this was the regulation was presented without a data, detailed data protection impact assessment. On the one hand, in the EU, we have established the digital gold standard in terms of the GDPR in 2016. And in the GDPR, there are certain requirements that were not met when this regulation, which got the digital health certificates into being, came into being. So the requirements of Article 35 in the GDPR are that a, a data impact, data protection impact assessment must be carried out when it is concerning certain fundamental rights of the citizens. And data, personal data and data protection of that. Uh, is a fundamental right recognized in the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union under Article 16, and also recognized under Article 8 of the Charter on Fundamental Rights in the European Union. So these requirements were not assessed. Then we have another regulation from 2018, which is applicable to all EU institutions. And under Article 39 and under Article 42, there are certain requirements that should have been met, which concern carrying out a data protection impact assessment before any such regulations come into being. It is correct that the EU data protection body was asked to give its comments, but it was not equal to having a data protection impact assessment. The a uh, reason why I'm talking about the data protection impact assessment is because it reduces risk to privacy, security, and it also ensures compliance and helps in maintenance of rule of law. And in the EU, we have many models that are available for carrying out such a DPIA, such as the French Commission has outlined some guidelines and methodologies the German Conference of the Independent Data Protection Supervisors Authority also has a standard data protection model, which could have been used. Uh, at the same time, I would also like to emphasize that it's important to understand that carrying out a DPIA or a data protection assessment is not an obstacle to fighting the pandemic. Um, another issue that I'd like to emphasize is that the way these digital certificates were approved or the regulation was approved is not in consonance with certain basic principles of EU law, such as legal certainty, principle of effectiveness, necessity, and proportionality. Uh, we've always said under EU law that a fair balance should be maintained. So here, a fair balance should have been maintained between, between the objective of a general interest pursued by the digital green certificate and the individual interest in right to privacy, data protection, and also preserving other fundamental freedoms, such as freedom of movement. Um, I'll go on to the next issue, which is about inadequate safeguards. Health data, as we know, is sensitive data. So vaccination status of an individual is sensitive data. Storing results of COVID test is also sensitive data. And then certification of recovery, all of these come under sensitive health data. And we don't have adequate safeguards. The more data that is collected, the more risk we pose to information security. To mitigate these risks, there are certain safeguards that are provided for under Article 32 in the GDPR. Uh, and again, sadly, they are lacking. The fourth issue of high risk of forgery and illicit sale of falsified COVID tests and certificates has been raised by Europol. And there are certain examples uh, that have been cited. For instance, in January of 2021, 8 million data sets were leaked in relation to COVID test results in the Netherlands. Then 
This year, forged vaccine certificates have been circulating in Germany. This has also been documented. The fifth important issue that I have, or the concern that I'd like to raise, is regarding data retention. While the Commission does not plan to establish a central database, it has been unequivocally stated, there is a, a lack of clarity regarding oversight of data storage at national level. Member states could potentially retain data from other member states as well, since no common systems have been established regarding updation, revision, or deletion of the data. There's no comprehensive guarantee of the repurposing of the data that is collected. And I would like to cite a few examples in this regard. In the summer of 2020, in Germany, registration lists that were mandatory at restaurants for criminal uh, were used for criminal investigations. This year in Austria, there's a draft legislation that embeds the data of the certificate in a comprehensive database which links COVID-related health data to statistical data, such as employment history and income, recent sick leave and education. So these are worrying. Uh, in this, these, all these examples are quite worrying in nature. Although Singapore does not fall under the regime of GDPR and EU, I've taken this example because it is, again, an area of concern. In January 2021, police at, in Singapore accessed data from digital contact tracing apps despite a government promise that this would not happen. So these are a few examples in which data can be repurposed. Um, and um, so I would like to offer some preliminary conclusions. The basic premise of repurposing highly sensitive health data in itself is fraught with danger. And then as a result, and on the basis of some of the examples that I've quoted, it is quite obvious that fundamental rights of protection of personal data and privacy are at stake when we are using these digital health certificates. WHO, uh, the next point I'd like to make is WHO declared the pandemic a year ago. So in that respect, it is not a sudden emergency. And uh, what I would like to say in the end is that the DPIAs or the data protection impact assessments should not be sidestepped uh, because they have a significant purpose and these DPIAs are actually some instruments that monitor the monitors. Uh, I think I'll stop here and then I'm happy to answer any questions now or maybe after all the speakers have spoken. Thank you very much, Bishop, for that excellent paper. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, and there were a number of issues there that um, that I think we can, we can certainly talk about once uh, once the other papers have um, have, have uh, taken place, so what we'll do is we'll, we'll we'll take questions at the end. I think if we if we go through the papers, and then we'll we'll have a chat about all three of them, and then we can take some pay, some, some some questions from the uh, from the audience. So, um, Amir, would you like to um, to start your paper whenever you're ready? Uh, yes. Um, well, the last panel, uh, they mentioned the dynamics of uh, emergency powers that become a guise for uh, lasting surveillance practices or the rules for uh, surveillance practices. And, and my paper basically deals with an opposite dynamic. It's when governments reappropriate measures used for national security uh, for uh, uh, civilian purposes uh, that has to do with pandemics. Uh, again, the, the, the background ruse is, 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 the, is, is the, the emergency, uh, the, the pandemic emergency. So uh, the paper, uh, Israel Seeking Oversight Ecosystem COVID-19 Secret Location Tracking as a Test Case, uh, is about that process, the process by which the uh, Israeli oversight ecosystem basically uh, 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 shape the legal framework pertaining to the use of counterterrorism measures for contact tracing purposes. Um, but in order to move on to the more, uh, let's say, uh, uh, critical analytic uh, part of the paper, there's a lot of descriptive grounds to cover. Um, we need to understand what is the uh, Israeli legal regime applicable to, to SIGIN, what is the uh, oversight ecosystem that surrounds it, how exactly both operated during the um, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, and only then the, the Israeli array of, of oversight bodies 
uh, uh, can be assessed. And sadly, we don't have the time for that, even uh, considering uh, our uh, missing um, respondent. So I aim to discuss three matters today. First, give a, a very a quick overview of uh, the, the Israeli legal framework pertaining, pertaining to SIGINT collection, mainly in regard to ISA uh, metadata acquisition activities in what uh, is, what was, uh, what is, uh, let's say, regular times. Um, then we'll prov- uh, move on to a quick outline of, uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, a quick outline uh, of the process uh, by which uh, the Shin Bet or the ISA uh, was um, authorized, uh, legally authorized to use its uh, special measures uh, for contact tracing uh, purposes during the, the corona pandemic. And I'll try to conclude with thoughts about whether uh, we can learn something from this affair about the working of SIGINT oversight in uh, a regular time rather than the unique conditions of the pandemic. But first, maybe uh, some terms, two terms should be clarified. First, when I use the term SIGINT, I mean signals intelligence. Uh, for our matter, it means any form of online surveillance practices, collection, acquisition, um, interception, processing, analysis, and so forth. Um, all of electronic communications. Uh, and when I say um, ISA, I mean the Israel Security Agents, uh, Agency, that's the official name. It's also known in, in, in various sources as Shabak, the Hebrew uh, uh, acronym Shin Bet, or GSS, General Security Services, all depends on which papers you're reading. Um, it's the Israeli agency equivalent to the British MI5. That is, it's a domestic security agency tasked mainly with counterterrorism and uh, counterespionage. Um, so, similar to many other jurisdictions, uh, Israeli uh, Israel's legal framework uh, applies different rules for uh, online surveillance uh, based on the purpose of the surveillance and the type of data acquired uh, thereby. So uh, you have different rules for uh, law enforcement purposes and for uh, national security purposes. Uh, the latter are naturally more uh, uh, lax. Another distinction is between acquisition uh, uh, of metadata and content data, uh, where uh, uh, SIGINT activities pertaining to uh, metadata acquisition and processing are uh, uh, governed by a laxer legal framework, which brings, when we bring the two together, it means that the loosest uh, legal rules apply uh, to uh, metadata acquisition for national security purposes. Um, and the ISA, the Shin Bet, uh, access to uh, metadata is regulated by a very narrow, not narrow, uh, a thin piece of legislation, Section 11 of the ISA law. Um, it authorizes the prime minister to set rules, secret rules, uh, for uh, transfer of non-content data from uh, telecos, any tele- telecommunication license holder, to the uh, Shin Bet, the ISA. Uh, under these rules, the prime minister may uh, decide that certain categories of data are required for the ISA's purposes, and it's a, the widest po- definition possible for uh, metadata, anything that is not content, uh, compare with what you see in other places where metadata is narrowly co- uh, defined as uh, only traffic data and uh, location data and so, and so forth. So <clears throat> the use of such data is subject to a written authorization, internal written or authorization by the director of the ISA, no judicial uh, uh, review whatsoever, uh, and it's effective in effect for six months and can be renewed indefinitely. Uh, any rules that the prime minister may uh, set are, re- are confidential, so is, uh, so is any kind of oversight activities by either uh, the attorney general's office or uh, uh, the Knesset Parliamentary Intelligence Subcommittee to which uh, uh, the ICE has to re- uh, report on these matters uh, on an annual basis. So in the past, when I was describing this uh, framework, I used to say that uh, uh, you can assume or you can um, hypothesize that uh, there's a, a, ve- a vast uh, 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 um, metadata collection program in place, or at least that this rules uh, allow for such a metadata collection uh, uh, program to take place. <clears throat> uh, something akin to what we have seen uh, uh, during the Snowden re- uh, revelation, and I'm talking about the metadata collection program of the prison program. Um, 
but this hypothesized uh, become true uh, hypothesis become true uh, on uh, uh, March 2020 when uh, an expose in an Israeli newspaper revealed the existence of something called the tool. The tool is a mass database of communications metadata that the ISA has been accumulating uh, for nearly two decades, siphoning all kind of metadata, anything that is not content from ISPs. Uh, uh, cellular providers and uh, landline providers, but the but still the bits and pieces. Uh, uh, wh while we have the legal framework that governs it, the, the, this very uh, thin piece of legislation, the the, the internal rules and safeguards uh, are still kept secret, as well as any parliamentary scrutiny. So, moving on to the Corona uh, pandemic by uh, mid March 2020. Uh, we have the rise in, in, in numbers of confirmed cases, and there, there's a bit, I wouldn't say panic, but uh, there, there's, there, there's stress building up, even in, uh, in the government, and already uh, the Ministry of Health approaches uh, the ISA and asks for two, uh, uh, in two different instances to, to perform some sort of uh, contact tracing activity based on geolocation data that the ISA has access to via the tool. Um, this is approved by the legal advisor of the ISA, approved by the ISA director. Uh, there's no, um, strictly speaking, there's uh, there, there's no legal basis for such an approval because any tasking of the ISA outside of its statutory duties, which are, again, counter espionage, counter uh, terrorism, uh, any tasking that goes beyond the scope is subject to a ministerial resolution that is approved by uh, the parliamentary subcommittee that oversees uh, the activities of the ISA. Um, and how does this contact tracing work? Um, well, the ISA collects all the geolocations of all cell phone users. So when someone, someone is a confirmed carrier of, of the virus, they would run a query um, that retrieves her whereabouts in the last two weeks, where she could have been infecting other people, and the identity of whoever was in close contact with her based on their geolocation. So all this data has been collected, and still is. Uh, this phone is being uh, uh, surveilled as we speak. Um, all this data is being collected anyway. And this is just a matter of a simple query that the RSA uh, has, has been providing data to, uh, by which the, the ISA has been providing data to the Ministry of Health. <coughs> um, so all this data that has been collected um, and this is basically an account of, of, of the dynamics of the purpose tree. It should be mentioned by this point that there was a contact tracing civilian application that, app that was deployed later on, uh, but the government has been more and more adamant in its reliance or insistence on the role of the uh, location tracking by uh, the Secret Service by the ISA. Uh, so a week after these first attempts the, uh, that I described, the Prime Minister briefs the nation uh, about the status of the pandemic. He hints that soon there will be uh, digital means reserved for uh, counterterrorism in thwarting the pandemics. And lo and behold, uh, there was an attempt to authorize uh, the use of the tool by getting uh, uh, this ministerial uh, resolution approved by a uh, parliamentary subcommittee. But that subcommittee was, um, <clears throat> was dissolved with the parliament that was uh, because, because of uh, recent elec uh, uh, elections. The parliament was uh, dissolved uh, before um, uh, uh, the subcommittee could uh, pr um, hold a proper hearing uh, regarding uh, uh, that authorization because the subcommittee would not rubber stamp the decision. And I suspect it was it that, uh, it, because of the, the background attempt uh, to form a new coalition that were uh, in the background. So the government resolution remained unapproved by the time uh, to dissolve the Knesset. So the government uh, uh, promulgated uh, or issued emergency regulations that authorizes uh, Shin Bet to engage in contact tracing. This prompted uh, a petition by several NGOs to the High Court of Justice which issued an interim order according to which um, the emergency uh, regulations will stay in force for several days until a new parliamentary committee, so the subcommittee will be uh, <coughs> will be formed. Um, and during that month, of course, that subcommittee was formed. During that month, uh, the subcommittee held rigorous hearings in which the government resolution was amended. Uh, these hearings were, uh, in an unprecedented move, uh, open to the public, uh, 
uh, streamed live. Um, and uh, the committee heard uh, uh, also a representative from academia and from uh, civil society. Um, the, and at some point, uh, uh, there were even threats by uh, the committee chairperson that the next resolution will be approved only if um, there will be proper uh, civilian alternatives presented uh, to the uh, committee. Uh, and in the mean, but but in the meanwhile, while this uh, the, this amended resolution was uh, uh, in place, uh, the court released this final ruling uh, under which it determined uh, that given the circumstances, it was permissible for the ISA to engage in contact tracing by way of government resolution that was approved uh, uh, by a parliamentary subcommittee. But any uh, uh, further extension of such authority authorization should be made by statutory law. And the court granted the government uh, uh, several weeks to kick off a legislative process. And so they did. Uh, that law was eventually enacted in the beginning of the second wave and of course immediately challenged the court. Uh, the court took its time. I, I, I suppose that it was uh, uh, in, in hopes that uh, the law will expire because it was a sunset condition. But again, due to some unique political circumstances, the effective uh, period of the law got automatically doubled as in other elections were uh, looming. Um, so in March, uh, the High Court of Justice released its final ruling on the law, determining that the law uh, authorizing Shinbet to engage in uh, contact tracing is indeed constitutional. It sets appropriate uh, proportionate criteria for the government uh, in deciding whether or not to authorize the ISA to assist in co contact tracing, uh, which unknowingly it echoed, I think, what uh, some of the uh, 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 UK experts uh, will recognize in, in decisions such as uh, uh, Liberty versus UK, um, or maybe uh, the European Big Brother decision, recent Big Brother decision. However, um, the court went a further uh, step further and examined the government decision. Uh, uh, the, sorry, examined the government decision making process and found significant flaws in it, rendering the. Uh, Administrative, administrative ministerial decision to use the ISA in value. Uh, so following that ruling, uh, the government refrained from making any uh, more resolutions to continue ISA authorization until the law finally expired. So the summary was a race against the, the clock uh, attempt to, to show the creeping process by which purpose creep uh, gradually became legitimate, mm -hmm. how uh, using counterterrorism surveillance measures <coughs> for what is mainly a civilian uh, uh, purpose was employed. Uh, now we can examine whether uh, this thing, the, this background could uh, uh, serve as a, a test case, because the COVID-19 affair poses a set of unique circumstances that allow us, uh, allowed us a rare peek into the working of, of civilian oversight in Israel. Uh, and However, these insights uh, that are further elaborated in the paper, uh, to which there is a link that you can all see, um, the insight may not apply to routine uh, SIGINT oversight, partly for the same reason that enabled us to look at the, these processes. Because first, the biopolitical nature of, IS, uh, of the ISA coronavirus virus, uh, location tracking differs greatly from the routine ISA surveillance for uh, counterterrorism and counterintelligence purposes. Uh, coronavirus tracking is not terror-related. It is not political. Um, there's hardly any reason for secrecy. There's no adversary whose awareness of being under surveillance might bring about operational risks. So it's easier for any decision maker or, or oversight body to uh, lift the veil of secrecy in this case rather than in, in normal times when uh, uh, the Secret Service is employed in its regular tasks. Um, another thing is that no one is immune to COVID-19. Well, as, as far as we know, even by now. Uh, there is a, a certain likelihood that overseas and, uh, and policymakers also will contract the virus and will be subjected to surveillance. And this possibility may, contri uh, uh, con may have contributed to uh, maybe an, some sort of an enhanced sensitivity regarding privacy matters. 
Well, whereas it's highly unlikely that overseas or policymakers shall become targets on, of, of counterterrorism surveillance at most times. So the willingness to sacrifice one's right and liberty for national security purposes is greater when uh, someone else is expected to pay that toll. We have, we, there's increased sensitivity to human rights when, once you might may be the target of the, the infringing uh, measure. Um, Another thing that is particular, uh, it's a, a particular issue with uh, uh, intelligence oversight is the matter of uh, judicial oversight. As targeted coronavirus surveillance, even untargeted uh, coronavirus surveillances, might not be significantly gaining from any judicial oversight. Uh, surveillance for law enforcement purposes, uh, a time for national security purposes, requires a certain estimate of human culpability. Uh, and the standards applying for uh, uh, coronavirus are not legal, they're medical. So the question of ex-ante review of online surveillance mm -hmm. is usually rendered moot within the context of uh, uh, coronavirus surveillance, while it is one of the most salient uh, uh, missing pieces in, in the Israeli uh, uh, signed oversight system. So... Despite these reservations, uh, the rare opportunity to look behind the curtain and see how Israel oversees its intelligence services cannot be overlooked. So when we analyze, <clears throat> when we analyze the performance of the various oversight uh, actors throughout this affair, and the paper does that, uh, several themes or lessons emerge. Um, all of them point basically uh, towards the need for an independent, dedicated, and expert signed oversight body. Uh, other themes well, we can see here are, are the, need, uh, the, the point of transparency and the, the role of civil society bodies. Uh, these themes are also explored in the papers. Since I'm out of time, I suggest we explore these elements or any other questions in the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you very much, May. That was, a, that was really, really interesting. I'm sure there will be lots of questions uh, from the audience at the end. So um, what we'll do is I'll hand over now to uh, Dr. Wenlong Lee and to Dan Yang. Thank you, Peter. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Yeah, thank you. Great. Um, thank you. So um, our paper seems to be one of the few that not bear immediately on COVID situation. And um, Dan and I um, intended to write the paper on Clearview AI. And um, by the way, Dan's not presenting today due to the fact it's already uh, late night in China. And uh, I would assume many of you have already heard uh, the company Clearview AI all over the news a few days ago uh, after the um, Australian Privacy and Information Commissioner uh, released the results of its investigation against Clearview AI in collaboration with uh, UK's information commissioner. And, um, um, but we have a, a framing uh, of the problem slightly broader than that because uh, there are more than one company uh, in the world that deals with this kind of uh, what we call facial data scraping. Uh, so just to give you a, a bit of background information as to what Clearview AI is and um, what they do and why uh, these practices may be problematic. Uh, the company was founded in 2017 by Richard Schwartz and the now CEO, uh, Hom Tong Dat. Um, and according to the CEO, this is a service that amounts to a web search for faces. And in for doing that, uh, Clearview AI has scraped more than 10 billion photos from popular social media such as Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and so on and so forth. And bear in mind that this number has been increased from 3 billion, uh, uh, and that's the number when the, the, the story about uh, Clearview AI first broke in early 2020. So there's a sharp increase within a one or two periods time. Um, Clearview AI markets uh, often with free trials to, to police and other law enforcement agencies worldwide. And it has been reported that 
uh, private vendors are also involved, such as Walmart, uh, AT&T, MBA, and many others. And uh, the engagement with private uh, vendors, uh, particularly in the US, ended after a, a number of class action in Illinois person went to a, a, a well-discussed uh, piece of legislation, the Biometric Information Protection Act, BIPA, uh, just to avoid the potential uh, sanction uh, uh, by the, the local authority. Uh, apart from these uh, controversial aspects, uh, according to a recent vendor test uh, in, conducted in the US, actually the algorithms from Clearview AI are performing really well. Over the 300 algorithms uh, from 200 uh, vendors. Actually, Clearview AI is among the very top top 10 uh, uh, performers in terms of accuracy. And it has been recently uh, uh, re reviewed that the, the company is dealing with some new uh, functions or capabilities that would allow uh, uh, the, the, the images with, no, with low uh, resolution to become uh, 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 finer or better, and uh, the algorithm will be able to recognize people even with the masks on. And here's on screen is also a, a common definition or understanding of web scraping, which refers to an automated process. Um, to collect large amounts of targeted data from different uh, websites. So essentially, it would involve uh, accessing a site that is hosted by another company. Um, um, and also uh, because of that, uh, some personal or private information may be scripted as well. So this practices actually would raise uh, different kinds of uh, legal challenges ranging from privacy uh, claims, uh, uh, anti-competition claims, and also in the US, there is a, a, a big debate about the, uh, uh, the relevance and application of the Computation Fraud and Abuse Act. Um, actually, uh, across the globe, there are several jurisdictions um, in which the practice of Clearview AI has been challenged. Um, probably the most popular background is the Illinois uh, Biometric Information Protection Act, BIPA, as I said earlier. And right after the story from the New York Times uh, broke, uh, a, a series of class or individual action followed. But at this moment, uh, the US judges are still at a phase to merge or transfer these uh, individual uh, complaints. So no substantial progress so far. In the meantime, uh, civil rights organizations such as uh, American Civil Liberty Union, uh, ACLU, among a few others are raising complaints on behalf of the citizens against Clearview AI. And they basically uh, put up with similar claims that uh, Clearview AI is violating uh, BIPA and uh, all the, 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 the uh, images unlawfully scraped should be deleted. Um, another piece of legislation in the UK is uh, the California Consumer Privacy Act. Uh, CEPA, which is also a basis on which uh, 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 individuals and uh, civil societies uh, challenge the, the clear view AI's practices. Another state, uh, Vermont, uh, takes a somewhat different approach as the Attorney General actually uh, 
uh, uh, raise a complaint against Clearview AI for the violation of the local consumer protection law. So what Clearview AI does is frame as unfair facts on one hand and material misinterpretation because they would promise that consumers are able to opt out. Um, but in fact, that's not the case. And in Vermont, there's also a, a data broker law, which is interesting as it uh, prohibits the acquisition of brokered personal information through fraudulent means. So uh, I, I would be very interested in seeing how uh, this approach would go. In Canada, a few uh, commissioners uh, across the entire country are, are, uh, held a joint investigation uh, against Clearview AI. And what's unique about this investigation is a kind of test uh, known as appropriate purpose, which is rather broad and inclusive. And according to which uh, Clearview AI violated uh, the Canadian law because for the appropriate uh, purposes, which cannot be rendered appropriate via consent. And actually Clearview AI didn't make any attempts to seek consent because uh, they simply assume that all the images are up for grabs, uh, publicly available. And the Canadian investigation eventually led to uh, the seizing of the Clearview AI uh, service across the entire country, as well as the deletion of all the images and uh, biometric facial arrays. In Europe, there are a few um, uh, investigations going on. Uh, one is uh, raised by Matt Schrems in, in, in Germany, uh, who exercise her, his right to be forgotten in the context of unlawful processing. So uh, uh, the logic is that um, Clearview AI is deemed unlawful for not uh, seeking consent before processing uh, facial images. And that provides a ground for exercising the right to be forgotten. Interestingly, the DPA um, eventually requested the deletion of the mathematical hash value, which is requested by Max Rams. Um, but the DPA didn't demand the deletion of the photographs of Max Rams, which is also part of the request. And the decision was also criticized for uh, its limited impact because actually uh, the DPA has the power to issue a pandemic, uh, uh, sorry, a pan-Europe order beyond ind individual litigation, but that was not the case. Also in Sweden, um, where there was high level of engagement by the, the Swedish police authorities, uh, uh, which led to an investigation by the local uh, DPA. And several legal issues were, were raised about the accountability, uh, whether the police uh, and the Clearview AI is able to demonstrate uh, compliance with the local law and also the legal basis for biometric processing, as well as the, the existence of a data protection impact assessment. The um, IMY eventually issued a uh, administrative fine of uh, 2.5 million uh, Swedish kroner, and also uh, requested uh, further training and education to ensure that uh, this would not happen again. And what may be uh, more familiar to the UK audience is the joint investigation by the OAIC and the ICO. Um, and the Australian commissioner uh, announced that um, the results uh, 
that Clearview AI actually failed to comply with the Australian law. And uh, similar to the Canadian case, the Australian uh, authority requires the seizing of collection of facial images and biometric templates and uh, the destruction of the existing images. While this is a joint investigation, the UK's ICO will deliver a similar but a separate outcome uh, in the near future. And this isn't over because a group of uh, civil society organizations led by Privacy International is raising complaints across Europe, including UK, France, Italy, uh, Greece, and Australia against uh, Clearview AI. So in the view of the um, isolated uh, complaints and on coordinated uh, enforcement, uh, it is the uh, intention of these uh, civil society organizations to seek a coordinated approach uh, across Europe. And similar claims are, are, are raised, such as the uh, legal basis. So um, here is a kind of a, a, a bird's eye view of all the um, uh, ongoing or concluded investigation or, or complaints going on. And from here, we can see a, a, a wide variety of, of um, um, measures uh, uh, going on, ranging from uh, class action to, to investigation by data protection authorities, and even those uh, uh, collaboration between uh, across borders. And also the, the legal issues raised are, are quite diverse as well. We've seen uh, uh, typical data protection concerns about uh, uh, consent, about accountability, and there are a few others that might speak to data protection or not, like um, unjust enrichment or, uh, uh, you know, those uh, um, competition or consumer-related uh, claims. In terms of results, um, although quite a few are still pending, at least we can see a kind of trend that... Um, most of the uh, investigation will lead to a, a, a finding that Clearview apparently violates uh, data privacy norms. And in some uh, cases, such as Canada and um, uh, uh, Australia, the, the, the investigation will even leading to the eradication of such operational businesses uh, 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 in, in, in that country. So several legal issues may be uh, distilled from, from this uh, observation, uh, which will conclude my presentation here. The first question is a, a simple and basic one but, uh, about white web scraping, whether it is lawful. So I think the, the question has been answered somehow in the US, uh, but in a, in a kind of a different perspective when the similar case, HiQ versus LinkedIn was delivered by uh, one of the district court in the US just a few days before the Clearview AI story broke. And which basically concludes that scraping a publicly available website uh, is not lawful, it does not violate the US law, even if the site's terms of service prohibit that scraping. But these standards or the criteria could be different when the practice is subject to not to economic. Uh, regulation, but to social regulation such as the GDPR and the law enforcement directive in which there is a standard of manifestly public uh, uh, test. And um, there appears to be a growing consensus that this test should be uh, interpreted narrowly 
so that clear companies like Clearview AI cannot rely on that for not complying with uh, data protection requirements such as informed consent. And this is clear uh, if we see the, the, the phenomenon of interest through the lens of biometric processing, because the data protection law actually raises the high bar for this kind of sensitive processing and explicit consent uh, is required. In the, the BIPA's terms, this is written consent. And even if the manifestly exception does not apply, uh, Article 6 about the general uh, legal basis of processing still applies, since it would be impossible to rely on legitimate interest consent uh, circumvented. And lastly, uh, which is the trickiest part of the, the issue is concerned with uh, law enforcement processing when uh, the data are supplied to law enforcement agencies and sometimes for law enforcement purposes, which would trigger a, a different uh, instrument in the EU law order, uh, the law enforcement directive. And uh, here, a consent is obviously not uh, uh, practical to, to practice. So what's relevant here is the strict necess necessity test uh, under the Article 10 of the Law Enforcement Directive. And particularly in this context of private-public partnership, uh, uh, the performance of this track is highly contextual and tricky and several uh, crucial uh, issues need to be resolved. Uh, and also um, the principle of purpose limitation, which is seems highly relevant in this context as Clearview AI is essentially about repurposing data for law enforcement agencies. Um, but looking at the reality, it seems that the, at least in the UK, the ICO is not quite keen on operationalizing this principle, particularly in crim criminal justice context. And lastly, uh, several alternative approaches are quite interesting, uh, like the consumer protection one I just mentioned, and also the broker law from uh, Vermont on just enrichment as well. I, I think uh, to some extent they could uh, uh, nourish or inform the uh, uh, data protection discussions somehow. So I will stop there here. Thank you very much, uh, Wenlong. Uh, that was that was absolutely fascinating. Um, and thank you to to all of our um, panelists um, for for three excellent papers. I'm, I'm sure we'll have lots of questions. Um, I've got, um, I, I would say we'd all give you a round of applause if you're all in person, but obviously we can't. So uh, uh, no, thank you very much for, 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 for your papers. So um, I've got a few kind of broad thoughts on, on what's been said. I am going to be a very poor stand-in for, for Judith, so I apologise in advance. But I think what, what all three papers um, have done is once again question the role of technology um, in 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 what our data and our information is being used for, how it's being used, and by who um, it is being used, and also the reasons given for um, for the use of that data, uh, and whether those reasons are legitimate in the circumstances. And this applies, as we've seen in all three papers, it can apply to um, commercial actors, it can apply to state actors, and as Wen Long's just been talking about, it can apply to, to situations where you've got state and commercial actors working together. And we've had problems with that in the UK with, for instance, the use of facial recognition technology, where we've had the police um, using this technology with commercial organisations. Uh, and that, that has raised serious concerns over how that kind of imp how that impacts on our, on our, um, on our rights. Um, it also questions, I think, the, the safeguards that are perhaps not in place to protect our, our data rights. Um, you know, for example, I think we've seen in all three papers that it seems that 
for example, COVID or state security or commercial interests can all be used as, a, as an excuse, a reason, whether that whether, excuse or a reason, perhaps an excuse to use our data without adequate safeguards or without adequate oversight. And I thought it was really interesting what Vishif was talking about in her paper, um, where you mentioned that um, uh, the, the use of DPIAs, for instance, were not an obstacle for fighting the the, the pandemic. Um, and I think that's, that was a great point. You know, these safeguards aren't obstacles to uh, protecting our rights, not obstacles to, um, for instance, to fighting COVID. They're not obstacles for commercial success. And I think not having them could actually sometimes hinder these um, these particular things that we want to achieve. And I think in the context of COVID, um, not having them could actually hinder the pandemic response effort, for example. Um, I've already mentioned sort of facial recognition technology in the UK. Um, uh, again, this is an example, I guess, of, of technology being used by um, as I've said, commercial actors, but also state agencies um, uh, to um, essentially, they've said, to protect our interests. Um, but of course, this is happening at the moment in the context of um, uh, the European Union, the European Commission saying that, you know, we shouldn't be using this sort of technology um, without a better understanding of its uh, of the implications on our fundamental rights and until we get a better idea of how to regulate that technology. Um, and I think the sort of things, things like facial recognition technology, but also what we've been talking about in these three papers from a UK perspective, could seriously impact the adequacy decision that we currently have in place. Um, and I think, you know, uh, the UK is potentially skating on thin ice at the moment when it comes to that. So these are all sorts of things that we need to be aware of. And I know talking to data protection lawyers, it's something that they are they are concerned about. It's how this sort of technology is being used by, as I've said, state actors and commercial actors, often in conjunction with each other, and what that means, not only for individuals, but what it may mean for the UK going forward as well. Hello, everyone. I am not ashamed to say that I have been so excited about this, this panel today on state surveillance and the rule of law, and you delivered in abundance. There was just so many fantastic insights from different jurisdictions on a whole variety of different areas from law enforcement and national security intelligence and you know how they all interwove as well to address this new area of national security we have, which is also health security, I think is very important in the pandemic context because now we have this other area of discretion that public authorities now have. And I thought that a theme that came throughout all of your papers in a very comprehensive way was the appropriate remit and scope and capacity of oversight. And when that takes place, whether it's prior oversight in terms of data protection impact assessments, there's the you know, very important point of the role that it serves. And then, of course, there's what form of oversight? And I thought Amir highlighted very well that there was also a need not just for quasi-judicial oversight for intelligence agencies, but for actual independent oversight for that added objectivity. And also the insights that when long brought in terms of the oversight capacity for data protection authorities. And one of the themes that emerged again from your papers from my reading of it, though I'm still digesting, I will be for long afterwards and no pressure, but I'm very looking forward to reading all of the finished papers on, on your work. But I thought a really significant key finding was the testing of the limits of these oversight bodies and that a more holistic approach has to be there if human rights and the rule of law and accountability is actually going to be mainstreamed across the entire policymaking process. You've got the development of the legislation, the oversight of its actual implementation, like the, the Clearview case study that you talked about, Wen Long, and then also the oversight and the impact and evaluation of this oversight at the other end in terms of Signet and what type of courts and tribunals you should have in place and the overarching oversight you should have in place as well. And that, you know, as was you know put very well by 
FISA uh, data protection impact assessments are just part of the overall approach. They're not a silver bullet. You know, I didn't for one moment think that you you made that argument. I thought that the argument was one of there's an, a very important overall framework where independent oversight plays a key role at different stages. But of course, you know, once you remove one of those key stages, it then undermines the effectiveness of all the rest. So I just wanted to say a, a special thank you for presenting some really fascinating papers on, on a topic I have a great interest in. So thanks to all the speakers and, and to Peter for being both a wonderful moderator and a discussant all at once and <laughs> at, short, at such short notice. Thank you. Thanks ever so much. Thank you. And and thank you. I, I'll just echo what Nora said. I think, you know, thank you to all of our panellists. They were really, really great papers. And um, I'm sorry uh, Jude couldn't be here. And I'm, I'm, uh, I know I wasn't a particularly good standing compared to compared to the sort of insights that Judith would, would offer. But um, thank you to all of you. Um, uh, they were great papers. And I also look forward to reading the full papers once uh, they're available. Thank you very much. Thank you, all of you. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.